Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Christian Hangout number 22. We've got kind of a small uh, group here so far. We have Mark Citadel and Lightning Patriot with us again. Uh, we don't have a topic. Uh, I was thinking we might talk about Christmas stuff, but it seems that Mark's already talked out about that. So we can talk about whatever else, because that's how it goes around here. It's laid back and informal. So uh, it's Friday night here. And uh, we're all kind of relaxed, and we're all just ready to kick back. Um, and we have three viewers. Hello, guys. So, uh, um. so, so, Mark, you came from the Plebeian podcast directly to this? Yeah, literally, directly. Wow, nice. I'm, I am kind of uh, worn down. I've been wage cucking all day, so... Uh -huh. Forgive me if I'm a little low energy tonight. Low energy. I'll be like the Jeb Bush. It's cool. Please clap. <laughs> <laughs> Jeb Bush. Yeah, Jeb Bush. I started to believe he was like considered the front yeah. runner for the nominee. At the beginning he was never of the, race. the front runner. That well, was. I mean, media, some people just assumed front. like all the money. If you have all the money, then you're definitely the front runner. But I mean, money is you everything. Could have, you could have learned that lesson from like previous elections so that's just not the case yeah. like obama did not have the most money in 2008 and managed to win over all the other democrats so well he had the media on his side though that was the thing yeah yeah well and in, in effect trump managed to make that the case as well i mean they weren't on his side but they kept giving him airtime so yeah it is really funny to think back about the 2008 election how that was just like the biggest love fest you ever saw for obama mm, yeah I mean, first like, black president. Yeah. First black president's making history, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... Th this, was, this was a white lash. This was a white oh, lash. Um, I guess it's Van Jones. Van Jones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. White lash. Uh, I've been doing quite a bit of like white lashing uh, at school. Like it's, it, it's very mild, but I've been doing it. What have you been doing? Like, I've been uh, posting memes or, like, speaking in a meme language. So I'll basically signal. I'll signal stuff. Oh. Yeah. So, That's what I've been doing for the most part. I've been signaling. There, does anybody actually get it, though? Like, do they understand what you're saying? Yeah, yeah they, they go with their, what I'm saying. A lot of them, like, a lot of us have electronic access when we post memes to each oh. other. So that's what I've been doing. So are, are you in high school or? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And like, uh, so I'm just curious, like, are there a lot of, like, alt-right people among your age group or? I would not say alt-right. Most, most of the people... When I came to the school, and still probably now, think of probably like probably, I would say a, a quarter of the male population is basically chads. <laughs> okay. So does that mean that they are sympathetic to rightist ideas or? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, most of them are. Yeah, that's encouraging, I suppose. However, the rest of the population is very diverse. Like uh, they get like inner city kids into the school. Yeah. And they're like all about the diversity. Like that's yeah. literally what they did. We had like a prayer service this week and they literally half of it was like my diversity, my globalism. A prayer service? Was it like yeah. a sort of like cross religious thing or something or? Yeah, I, I go to a religious school, Catholic. Oh, okay. okay. But there's so, but so it was Catholic, but they were talking about diversity and globalism. It well, that was the kind of thing that they were bringing across. Like we're a very diverse school. We respect everyone's views. Yeah. Yeah. You should. You should tell them like. Uh, you should tell them your views and see if they. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's basically them. what I've been uh, signaling. <laughs> like, would you respect the devil's views? Yeah. The devil's words. Yeah. Let me let me just sit you down and tell you all about the um the Goldbergs and Shekelsteins <laughs> in the media and see if you still respect my views. 
Shekels. 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 Oh. Yeah, mostly. You know, I got. I've got to say, like the recently, I've just been. I've been kind of getting um, really annoyed with certain um, Jews on Twitter, especially like Kurt Eichenwald. I don't know if any of you know who that is. Yeah, Can I know. I was just watching, he, he, he just complained that people are tweeting, uh, tweeting uh, strobe effects at him when you know he has epilepsy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw one of those because he had like a meltdown on Tucker Carlson. I mean, and his profile picture on Twitter is fake news. He doesn't look anything like that. He's like uh, 200 pounds heavier than in that picture and uh, looks more sort of weaverish. Um, I remember he's just, uh, uh, pathetic. Yeah, go on. And then, and then there's also Tim Wise, of course, who's the ever present um, sort of I mean. oven fodder. But he he like tw- had this tweet that he has now had to like walk back to. He said something like, um, "Oh, I'm glad my f- my about- quarter of my family left Imperial Russia, that shithole, uh, some yeah. number of years ago. Hope there's another communist revolution soon." And then he tweeted, <laughs> uh, "Your when you you know when your country has only exported Fabergé eggs." autocracy and pogroms yes. you sh- nobody should ever listen to you and then even like national review were like uh, going at him saying uh, you know have you ever heard of like dostoevsky have you ever heard yeah. of like, the electric tram any of this stuff and he, he was then like oh no no i was just trolling the ethno nationalists i didn't mean you know fucking hell literally getting get in my oven you piece of crap yeah i really don't like that guy he's He's, like, He's the I worst. Really the I can't think like of medically. anyone. I can't think of anyone worse. Really, it, no one worse comes to mind for me. No one more sort of with a darker soul than this uh, this anti racism uh, educator, as he fashions himself as. I think I'm going to write an article for K uh about it. Uh, I'm just going to sort of I'm going to frame it as. Um, that really, I mean, it is the the liberals are really the people who are filled with this kind of hatred, uh, and it is occasionally like the mask slips, and I think that's a that's a really sort of solid occasion where it's kind of slipped, and he's just sort of revealed what a yeah, it's a troll that he really is, and I don't mean that in the sense of like he trolls people, I mean that in the sense of like he is literally a troll. <laughs> you know, you remember the people found out that he actually lives in a like ninety seven percent white neighborhood. Yeah, I can't remember who asked him that. It's not the uh, Well, I think I found a. I think it was on a message board. They found some. They were able to track down his home address and then look up the demographics of it through the census, yeah. and they found that it's ninety-seven percent white. And what's funny is I actually. I was curious about uh, Jared Taylor, so I was able to find out what his home address was, and so I found out, looked up the demographics, and his neighborhood is ninety-two percent white. So, ironically, Tim Wise lives in a whiter neighborhood than Jared Taylor does. By one percent, <laughs> well, it's like five percent still. It's not insignificant, theoretically. Oh, Kurt! I'm, yeah, I'm reading like that. Kurt Eichenwald actually had a seizure. Is this true? He's, I think he's claiming that, like he has epilepsy, so like strobe so, yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing this screen, a screenshot of his tweet. Like somebody, his account has tweeted out. At Jew Goldstein, which is obviously the person who sent <laughs> yes, this. Yes, this that. is his wife. You caused a seizure. I have your information and have called the police to report the assault. I don't think it's an assault wow. to send a tweet. <laughs> you know, somebody else said like somebody said like if, if if a strobe effect would give you a seizure, then you should disable gifts on your Twitter account. Why do you not know how to do this? <laughs> Should you even be using a computer <laughs> at any time? It could flash yeah. up, you know, like a blue screen or something. Uh. You know, uh, Kurt Eichenwald, I remember Todd Kincannon trolled him on Twitter a few years ago. It was kind of funny. And he said something about Pulitzer stuff because I guess he's won a Pulitzer Prize or he claimed to. And he just says something like, I bet you like to show your Pulitzer stuff to the ladies or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, yeah. it, was, it was the con. I don't know if you know Todd Kincannon, do you? Do you? Yeah, he's, I don't know. He used to have a Twitter guy and he'd troll people all the time. And he was hilarious. Mm. Yeah, Holy no. shit! Yeah, he he is claiming that he had a seizure. For self protection, I'm taking a short Twitter break. I'll be spending that time with my lawyer and law enforcement going after one of you. Last night, for the second time, a deplorable 
aware I have epilepsy, tweeted a strobe at me with the message, you deserve a seizure on it. It worked. This is not going to happen again. My wife is terrified. I am disgusted. All I will be tweeting for the next few days are copies of documents from the litigation, police reports, etc. Once we have a lawsuit filed, we will be subpoenaing Twitter for the identity of the individual who engaged in this cross-state assault. A cross-state wow. assault. I'm pretty sure the only way you can engage in that is to like, go up to the border of a state and punch somebody across it. At this point, the police are attempting to determine if this is a federal a federal crime. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because it appears to be cross-state. Because it's over the internet, this kind of assault will never happen again without huge consequences. This individual will be going to court and he will be paying a price. And if any of you others ever try the scan, I will make sure of it. And make sure it happens to you. Online anonymity does not protect criminals. That's why subpoenas exist. You are facing a criminal investigation and a lawsuit. So if any of you others... That's not very good grammar. Think about trying this cute prank. Consider the consequences. They will be severe. Again, I will not be I will not be seeing your comments or tweeting for a while except to upload copies of litigation. I have a hunch that no litigation or police reports are going to appear from this guy's Twitter account. Yeah. It's the same person well, who was on Tucker Carlson the other night saying, uh, Donald Trump was in a mental institution in 1989 and then was repeatedly asked, where's your evidence? And he was like, just completely uh, filib filibustering for the entire time. I'm a... Uh... On the Daily Show a few weeks ago, they were talking about Kurt Eichenwald and saying he like literally just makes all these claims and never cites a source for them. Like he just, so he just says like my sources tell me such and such, and he never has any evidence for it. It's just so he literally just makes stuff up. This guy's a nut. Hmm. I'm tweeting now. I'm not believing that Kurt has had a seizure until I see a video of him having a seizure. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my grandmother had epilepsy, but I never saw her have a seizure. I think she had it under control pretty well. Mm, I've never. Well, my dad's had seizures, but he's diabetic, so like he's had kind of like those low blood sugar seizures you you uh, sometimes have. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never yeah. like uh, seen an epileptic seizure before ever. I don't know if they're different. If they kind of look different. Yeah, I'm not sure. Interstate assault or cross state assault. That's that term just is funny. Who comes up with that? <laughs> Reminds me of a movie they watched on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Do you ever watch that show? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, well, they watch it. So basically, the premise of the show is that they watch these like cheesy movies and they they just kind of make fun of them. Like, they have these characters silhouetted in the foreground. Mm. It's like they're in a theater watching it, and they just sort of heckle the movie, and it's really funny. You've never seen that before? No. I don't know. Maybe they don't show it in the UK, but they probably it's a really funny show. And they're watching this like low-budget '80s action movie called Final Justice, where there's this sheriff who's in Texas who lives near the border of Mexico, and so he's chasing these two guys who are like Italian or something, and they cross the Mexican border. He's like, "Hey, you can't, you can't do anything to us. We're across the border." And he's like, "Oh yeah," and he pulls out his gun and shoots one of the guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a funny movie because the guy keeps getting into trouble with the law, even though he's he's actually in law enforcement himself, and he ends up going to Malta to track down this guy he's chasing, and mm. he like gets in all kinds of trouble there. It's, it's a funny episode. Mm. So I mean, it's quite you cool it on see. YouTube. Yeah, I'll have a look at it. what's it called again. Well, the show is called Mystery Science Theater Three Thousand, and basically it's a two-hour-long show where they watch a movie. Mystery Science Theater Three Thousand. Mystery Science. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that episode on YouTube. Let me see if I can find it. I'll, you can watch it later whenever you want. Yeah, yeah. Shoot me a link. Watch two hours. Okay. Jodan Baker. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I think I got it here. I actually yeah, I went back it. and listened to your whole, uh, the whole hangout you had last time because I only joined for like an hour, didn't I? Um, uh, that probably. Was, yeah, that was quite a, that was quite a storm you uh, brewed up there. <laughs> Yeah, Second Drake and uh, Adam Gray kind of. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Yeah. Adam actually said he wanted to, to address some of the stuff from that hangout on Good Morning White America, but I guess he never got around to it. 
or he hasn't gotten to it yet. So he's on um, TRS, it. right? Well, yeah. Uh, Good morning, White America is uh, it's a TRS podcast, although he did his own podcast, podcast before that. Okay. Yeah, nice. I, I don't know if it's syndicated, but like it's they aired on they link to it on their uh, their website. So I guess it's yeah. related with TRS. I've never been invited on a TRS podcast, so I thought it'd be cool to hear this hangout mentioned there. <laughs> mm. But I know you got invited on Rebel Yell a while back, Mark. That was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, great, great group of guys there. That was a. Uh... They had, uh, they had Very, Pop Lewis on recently. Did you see that one? No. Yeah. It was a good episode. He actually seemed to get along with them pretty well. I mean, they didn't talk about the... Uh, the stuff uh, we talked about. <laughs> Mennonite stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they were just talking about history, and it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, yeah, they, I definitely... Uh, I like the structure of uh, what we... What we went through, and I, I appeared with uh, Folkways as well recently. So, yeah, and I'm going to oh, be yeah, appearing the, uh... again with with Millennial Woes. Um, oh. uh, I think on well, like a day, um, maybe the 29th. Oh no, I think it's the 30th. So the 30th, I'm going to appear with Woes uh, and Adam Wallace. So we're going to have a chat with him, which is going to be sort of our first uh, time contact, co- time sort of contact with him uh, after he returned from his America tour. Do you know if he's back in Scotland? Yeah, yet, he's or? back. He's back now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been able to follow Millennial Woes. Like I said, I've been having a hard time keeping up with a lot of YouTube channels lately because I just got so much stuff that I'm trying to keep up with. But mm-hmm. I did see some of his videos when he was in America, like when he met Anti Dem and went to Walmart and stuff like that. <laughs> At least my YouTube channel is easy to keep up with because I can only do a video like once every month and a half. Yeah. You know, I've, on speaking of your appearance on Rebel Yell, I think that that was where you quoted some Russian guy who said, "To the right of me, there's only the wall." Yes, yeah. Was that, yeah. Who was that guy? Uh, Vladimir Purushkevich. Yeah, that's a good quote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but he was one of the the, the people who uh, shot Rasputin. Oh, in nice! The infamous assassination. So that's where that's where most um, historians would know the name from. But yeah, but prior to that, he was a uh, essentially probably the most right wing uh, person in the Russian Duma. Um, and yeah, certainly a, a very interesting figure. I wish he, there was uh, some of his translated work around. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of stuff's been lost since that era. Yeah, I sometimes wonder how much great stuff has been lost to the ages just because it's been destroyed or gotten yeah, yeah, lost yeah, somewhere. Absolutely. Sad to think about all the treasures that are gone from history. Yep, and uh, you know a lot of treasures are waiting to be found still. Certainly, you know there's still a lot of stuff yeah, that's true. floating around. It is kind of funny when somebody like unearths something that was thought to be lost. Yes, yeah. There's like always a potential for that to happen. Yeah, it's funny when, uh, like, somebody has, like, a collection of films in their basement or something, and they find, like, a film that they thought was, there were no copies available of it or something. And mm, yeah. I like to save things. I don't know. If, sometimes I wonder if, like, it'll be the only copy of something available someday. I don't know. Mm. I don't have too many old things. Uh, I've got a very old copy of Max Scheller's Resentment, which I don't know. You can always tell the book's old because of the binding. So I'll hang on to that. Nice. It reminds me of when I was in college. Uh, I was doing research for a paper I was writing, and I actually found a book in the library that was from 1906, and some of the pages hadn't even been cut on it. Wow. Like, they had those pages that, like, you have to cut the pages to open it up. I had to actually <laughs> sort of tear it apart yeah. just so I could read the, what it was saying. Mm-hmm. I guess that would have been almost 100 years at the time. Wow. I remember Theodore Dalrymple was talking about how a lot of these used bookstores he goes to, 
or it's like they just throw out books because they haven't they can't find anyone to take them but and he thinks it's a shame that all these great books get lost because there's just basically nobody who wants them mm. he writes a lot of articles about the i think he said he has a policy that every time he passes a, a used bookstore he has to buy something so Mm -hmm. He collects lots of old books and he finds like inscriptions on them from like hundreds of years ago. And like, the, like he actually uh, sometimes even finds that they belong to people who are somewhat well known. It's, it's really interesting to read the articles about the things he finds in these old books. Mm. That's a good policy actually to just buy, you know, buy something at least whenever you come across like one of those shops. Yeah, I don't come across them too often. Used to be a lot more. There used to be a lot more of those in the UK, but they're, I guess they're gone now. A lot of those antique type places. Yeah. William said he might be joining later, but he might be late. So hopefully he'll come at some point. And stay. I've got. Um, Pretty packed work schedule, and I will need to get some sleep at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I mean, I understand how that is. Yeah, the time difference is pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, I know that uh, a couple weeks ago I I had a day where I only slept like two hours because I took on this uh this this uh job that I wanted to do. It's like a temporary job. I really wanted to participate in it, even though I already had my other job that took up a lot of time so I was running on very little sleep mm. it was it was all right is it true that you can never really catch up your sleep I wonder about that sometimes mm. I mean it seems like I never quite get enough as much sleep as I would like to get yeah at one point I know that if that's I true was... I'll never know <laughs> One point I was thinking of is going full trad and like sleeping in in like the afternoon. Hmm. I've always I've always yeah. like considered that. Yeah. You mean like taking a nap or something? Taking a nap, but like I, I was done back in the old days before they had gas lamps. That that's what really changed it. Was that people used to sleep? like six hours from like midnight to around dawn and then go to bed around noon and then wake up during dusk. Hmm. I don't understand how that would work though. I mean, like, I don't know. Like that's where naps came from. Okay. At least, at least that's what I read. Hmm. I don't doubt like, it. Yeah. Like how long ago was that? Are you talking like this, from a lot of what I'm reading, and this is like all over the web, this probably, change probably started <clears throat> around the, around like the <clears throat> ah, 17th and 18th centuries. Hmm. Really had a shift in the 19th century with gas lamps. And then okay. it just was completely phased out in the 20th century because of electricity. Yeah. I had something in my throat. It's all right. I know uh, Brett Stevens often talks about how he thinks we could probably do a lot less work than we do. Like, like we're not really making as much as we do, but it's just kind of where society is taking shape. It's necessary to work eight hours and get very little sleep and yeah but really like he thinks we could probably do but we could probably spend about half as much time working as we actually do and it would be better off well that's true i mean that's just part of the um that's part uh, of where, got... where we've arrived to at a, at a kind of capitalist system it's why i think most um at least most people i've spoken to in the reactor sphere are more uh wedded to ideas of certainly not socialism but um you know some kind of national socialism <laughs> yeah i know what you're going with that no they're wedded to a more kind of um 
I'd say like neo-feudal or sort of going back to that type of system where you still have a relatively sort of free market. You still have a lot of kind of competition and not a lot of federal involvement in economic affairs, but economics is more geared to like some, a certain purpose, like providing something for a given community rather than, um, you know, just producing as much as you can kind of sell in a, you know, very mechanical way which is you know fed into globalization and fed into the transfer of labor certainly around the world and and yeah the increase of the the amount that people work i mean it was unthinkable just a hundred years ago that you'd work on a sunday but you know how many people these days work on sundays i work literally every day i don't get days off (laughs) exactly and that that shouldn't be the case you know i know i hate it it's really killing me i think but I gotta find something better. Yeah. What do you think of corporatism? You see, corporatism is like um, I, I, some some of the authors I really like in economics have like used corporatism as a term. But I mean, I don't. I'm not a huge fan of like where it's been practiced as corporatism. Uh, and it always depends on how you define it, because like corporatism, where it's been implemented, has always been implemented in, it's in different ways. It's the corporate ways. state, man. Yeah, I mean, we effectively live in yeah. a corporatist slash socialist type economy. That, I mean, that's that's Sorry. the thing in terms of in terms of like services and stuff. We live in well, I mean, I can I can speak living in Western Europe. It's obviously a little different in the United States, but we live in very much socialist uh, economies. In terms of um, industry collusion with the government, we live in corporatist economies. But in terms of like our underlying assumptions about how economics works, in terms of like our underlying thought about uh, material goods, we live in a capitalist economy. So it's like you're getting all three at the same time. And it's just like... Uh, you know, largely, I think it's all having a very negative effect on everyone. Yeah. Well, how do you define corporatism exactly? Just like where corporations collude with the, the government actively. Well, yeah. Yeah. So they do that anyway. They're just not supposedly allowed to, but we all know that they do. I mean, you can yeah. only have to look at Hillary Clinton. Well, I think that's what, how a lot of people say it, but I think corporatism is like more like sort of a lot of fascists are very corporatists, like sort of the Falange or uh, mm. fascist Italy. And to some extent, I think Mosley was a corporatist. Uh, I think they call themselves syndicalists, which syndicalists. might be something slightly different. I don't know yeah. if that's absolutely the same National as Italian. syndicalism, yeah. Italians called it corporatism. Yeah, um, and I know Austrians hard. also yeah. called it corporatism. corporatism. Um, but syndicalism and certainly distributism are, are slightly different, I think. Distributism was what you had in Brazil uh, with, um, oh, what, what were they called? Integralists, yeah, thank you. Plinio Salgado and the integralists. Um, so that was more of a Latin American movement. Uh, okay. But yeah, I mean, you can see... Well, I, Chesterton... driving, I think a correct point, which is that, um, you know, the economic... Uh, functions of society should be geared toward, towards some kind of societal goal. I'm just not sure that corporatism, as practiced certainly in Italy, had the had the correct dynamic worked out. I think it was still trying to, in some ways, um, you play within the modern sort of playpen within the kind of modern paradigm of how economies have to work, supposedly. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think the ideal, like, how should we push? our current state of, of the economy towards? Uh, well, no, I, I wouldn't say that it's possible to push it towards anything that we'd like. I think that what need, what would have to happen would be that it has to simply collapse. It has to, mm-hmm. it has to kind of come undone and then economy has to reemerge in an organic fashion. Uh, you know, yeah. when, when you have collapsed states, economies do, you know, organic type of economies do just naturally emerge because there's not the, there isn't any of the substructure for the kind of economy that we have today to exist. Once that's gone, that all just comes down. So you have to have an economy that is, you know, much more localized uh, and does have a kind of power relation to it, um, which is what sort of uh, neo-feudalist type ec- economics would advocate. Um, it would be the end of sort of you are a labor unit and you sell your labor that's that's not really a viewpoint that's held in 
um, sort of a, the, the type of pre-mercantile economics that was described by people like Ottmar Spahn, for example. So, what do you think the United States, like, how will it collapse, most likely? Do you think that... <laughs> It's, it, it depends how it happens, doesn't it? I think it. I think it inevitably will happen. It just depends how it happens, and that yeah. that will shape what it looks like afterwards. Well, I have to see how the demographics go. I think is a lot of is going to have a big part of that. I think demographics yeah. will definitely play a role. Whether they're right. the yeah. trigger, yeah, I think they'd be more of a a sort of a guiding factor as to where it goes rather than the trigger. I don't think. I don't think that. Um, who was that guy who wrote the Turner Diaries? Uh, William Pierce. Harold coming? No, no, that's yeah, well, I the think Northwest Front. Yeah, I don't. Uh, you know, no, I don't I, think I, that's I think the Northwest Front guy. Yeah, I uh, don't think that's how it's going to happen. I don't think that's going to be just one day a massive race. I don't even. Pierce, I haven't right? even read the Turner Diary, so I don't really know how yeah. he envisions it. But I mean, yeah, I but just hear stories about how, like, if you look at these former countries, like, like, like in Africa, South Africa, and places like that, how. There's a lot of infrastructure there that just doesn't work. It's just like non-functional because they don't have people there who, who know how to maintain it. So, I mean, if something like that happens where it's just like there's kind of this gradual decay where, where yeah. everything just the kind th of becomes The thing useless. is people there are used to that, though. People there have never really had functioning, uh, you know, state, nation-state type structures, apart from the artificial colonial ones, which were really only built on uh, ex you know, ex exporting resources from those lands. They weren't you know, built on uh, sort of functioning as coherent governments for the people or you know, making the people's lives any better, really. Uh, and as such, I mean, those people know how to live in those conditions. They, you know, they know how to get by. They know how to get by very locally as well i that's the scary thing about the west is that we've completely lost any uh, what was that uh, there was something i was reading quite a while ago about how if if power was cut to just like the eastern seaboard of the united states uh, a like a ridiculous number you'd never suspect would be dead within a week i've from... thought about that actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, what, it's what, just crazy because all the EBT cards turning off, everything you know, all the welfare turning off, every, all the oh, hospitals geez. turning yeah. off. It, it would just be pandemonium, and I think we underestimate how not ready people are for something. And I don't want to sound yeah. like a, a prepper stuff, you know, trying to sell you um, seeds and <laughs> getting you to buy gold from William Devane. Uh, you know, don't don't bother going out and doing that. I think the, the people who are going to benefit in those society, those types of situations and the people who are going to survive and do well are not the people who are going to have hoarded stuff in their basement. They're going to be the people who have formed like networks and, and groups of people who uh, trust one another and are ready to kind of work as a cohesive unit in the absence of that structure. And it's those cohesive units, by the way, that are going to, you know, they're going to build the next states. They're going to build the future societies. And that's what I think the the reactionary project, the project of the React Sphere has, has really been, is we, we'd like those communities to start sort of clandestinely forming and emerging, these kind of brotherhoods, sort of unity between individuals so that when the system does eventually sort of overthrow itself and we want to help it along of course but when it does that we're ready to capitalize on that and it, that that has special significance in europe because of course in europe in western europe at least there is a group of people who are already doing that who have been doing that for a long time and we don't necessarily want those people and i think we know who we're talking about to uh <laughs> when the time comes to have an advantage over over us uh, in a sense, we need a parallel society. We need to be readying ourselves for the the day it comes. Otherwise, we're going to be at the mercy of these very savvy, these savvy, um, you know, Allahu Akbar's, and uh, it's not going to be good yeah. for anyone. They talked a little bit about that on uh, Good Morning White America the other day. I think they're talking to these. Uh, there's this like Kenneth couple that they have on. Sometimes they talk to them, and they're talking about forming networks and things like that. It's interesting. <laughs> You should do that, you know. It, um, people kind of are not may, maybe uh, very nice to Matthew Heimbach, but you know he actually did it. He's gone out to a very tiny little community. He's, you know, he's encouraged people who are associated with him to move there as well, and they have formed. They have kind of integrated into their own little community. That that is what I think good activism is. That for me, uh, what I think that Heimbach should realize is that that's more valuable. What he's doing there is way more valuable than 
protesting Tim Wise at, at the university or whatever. That that's actually a valuable form of activism, is preparing and getting yourself into that a community actually sort of engaging with it rather than this sort of you know the street type activism which has really dominated uh, the right at least for the past what 60 years 70 years yeah hey william hey can you hear me yep and welcome yeah, well, i mean thank you <laughs> good day everything you talking about we don't have i've just cut in on you What's guys that? Yeah, we were just talking about forming communities and sort of uh, having networks of people that oh, you can okay. rely on. Just talking about how things collapse, we need to have uh, infrastructure connections. Well, yeah, and just connections to other people who can we can rely on. So I mean, right now, honestly, if stuff happened. I don't know what I would who I would rely on because I don't have a lot of really close friends and. But you've got a little time. You're you're okay. You've yeah. got a little time, and you can make it happen. Um, but the growth of this um, movement, if you want to call it that, is is generating those opportunities. And uh, you know, when they present themselves to us, we should uh, we should seize upon them, as we are yeah. able to, of course. I actually thought about moving back to the Midwest. I wonder if I'd do better there, because like I feel yeah. like I've never. I've always been kind of a fish out of water here in the Upper South. I guess I don't know. I think the one thing that worries me about me with the Midwest is that it's very flat. And they're just kind of thinking mm -hmm, ahead. Nebraska and places like that. Yeah, but like you think of flat land and you think of places like Poland. Yeah. Like it's easily invaded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you want some mount you want to be like sort of like Romania or so you want to be have like loads of mountains and yeah. And things like yeah, that. Yeah, Virginia, easily defensible. West positions. Virginia Virginia has a lot of opportunities except for the fact it's near Washington. Oh yeah. But was uh, yeah, West Virginia would be very hard to invade. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's like through. literally Afghanistan. It is a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> it has the Basically, panhandle yeah. and everything. It's it's like a mini Afghanistan. And Afghanistan yeah, well, has, exactly. has never been conquered. Uh, well Afghanistan has been I'm sure it has been conquered. Didn't, well, not Alexander, didn't Alexander the Great conquer Afghanistan? Well, he probably yeah, just said, I, he he probably some, said some yeah, I did it. Up there or something like that. He probably just walked through it and said, yes, I've conquered it. And they, they just paid him no heed. <laughs> That's the thing. I think like, even even when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, it was very hard to control everything. Mm. So I think, I think Ira Iran kind of has only been invaded twice that I can think of. Uh, oh, no, three times, I guess the... The Muslim, Alexander, Alexander the Great, Empire. the Arabs, and the Mongols. The Romans the almost Indian. conquered it. Almost, yeah. I don't think they fully, fully got it because Iran it, is qu Iran is quite hard to they conquer. Were it's out. Surrounded by mountains, and then the middle of it is just uninhabitable. I never knew that about Iran before, sort of researching it. Is that the real Lu Yi? No, it's a fake one. <laughs> He, he said he couldn't. He told me on Twitter he couldn't make it tonight. So, I'm know. just reporting that I'm alive. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Louis has been tweeting up a storm on Twitter. I've been I've been following it. He's been going hard at it. Somebody's calling me. Hold on, Sam. That's weird. Sam's oh, he's calling all of us. Uh, I think, yeah. On a second. Everybody's late getting in today. Yep, looks like it. But late night. Had a good conversation. I'm kind of, I'm kind of waiting for Liu Yi to become like, uh, sort of the Count of Hong Kong. I think that's going to be a possible in the future due to his based tweets. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need a higher title. Higher title. What, what one would you like? <laughs> You want to be the king or emperor? You can't be just emperor of Hong Kong. Hello? No, 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 it's okay. I'll, uh, uh, um, my, my, my son can be emperor. I just that the uh, son emperor. Much of a pain for me to be emperor. So <laughs> legendary. Second, yeah, I think Sam's trying to get in, but yeah, just. Uh,
So I've got the link there. If he wants to join. So, uh, yeah. Just uh, send, send the link. I think he's trying to get in, but he's, he ended up make, making a call instead, and I don't know if I can be in two hangouts at once. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, I was in one with him, too, there. Anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's easier to have only one hangout, so. So, yeah, I'm sure this is exciting for everyone to listen to this just going, uh. Oh, you just have to say the, the, the normal thing that nobody ever does. Oh, we'll just edit this out. <laughs> and then they never do because you always hear them saying, oh, we'll just edit this out. There he is. All right, there you go. Hello? Hey, Sam. Hey, Hi. what's up? Yeah, it's my first time uh, logging into Hangout from my phone. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You sound like you're kind of over the phone right now. Yeah, I'm also uh, driving right now. Um, oh. Uh, Bluetooth support. So, yeah. Okay. Hopefully you can hear us all right, and I think we can hear you oh, yeah, okay. Please. I can understand what you're saying. Yeah. How's the sound quality compared to, like, over... Not bad. You sound like you're on a phone. Yeah, you sound... Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. You sound like you're... Yeah. So I was listening in on the conversation. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, you know, I think it's very important for, like, people to form communities um, is during the coming... Uh, collapse that's inevitable because of our stupidity, especially here in the web. So, so the Benedict option will become the Benedict uh, necessity. Is that the, is that the theme? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that term before, but I'm not exactly sure what it actually means fully. Well, the Benedict option means you're sort of withdrawing from society, right? You're kind of just being parallel, a parallel society in a way. Yeah, kind of. Well, you're not completely withdrawing from society if that's what you're talking about. Well, I mean, you're withdrawing from it to an extent, but like you need to, in some way, interact with society, like especially for work, you need to interact with people that are not like you, who don't think like you, who are pretty much brainwashed by like the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bit like, uh, it's a bit like uh, the, the kind of um, black nationalism some decades ago when people were like, you know, uh, think black, uh, buy black. It's, uh, I, th I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to probably have to develop. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't interact with non-Christians. I mean, given that we're in this society and God has put us here, I think we have the duty to, um, mm. you know, to, to have relationships with people outside and to uh, show them the gospel and stuff. But uh, I think the important part is having some kind of economic self-determination and not one that's just based on the individual or even the nuclear family, but uh, one that involves the broader Christian community whenever possible. I think they still do that buy black stuff in, among black communities, I guess. They try to promote those kind of things even today. Well, yeah. after racial uh, desegregation and forced busing, I think it's... Uh, it's. I'm sure it's still a thing, but it's... Uh, less maybe it's a bit less visible mm -hmm. well I, I was mentioning uh the people on a uh, good morning white america they were, were interviewing they they were kind of suggesting that like we should like we should find christian businesses to support or if you're white find white businesses to support this is a way of connecting with a community they were talking about stuff like that. It was a good conversation they had. Hmm. 
What if what if those people would ever appear on this hangout? It might be a good conversation. Yeah. I followed the guy on Twitter, but I don't think he followed me back, so I don't know if he's aware of my existence. Who's that? Yeah. Well, do you listen to the podcast Good Morning White America and ever? Didn't we have him on last week? Well, yeah, we had Adam Gray on, but there's these uh, there's this couple he has a he talks to regularly. I think it's they go by Hans and Anna Gigax. I don't know if those are their real names or if those are pseudonyms. Oh yeah, but, no, I haven't listened like, to that much. I thought um, yeah, well, Adam. I thought Adam was the husband in that duel. Well, yeah, it's him and his wife, but it was the people I'm talking about are two. It's a different couple that they had on as guests, and just they did a segment with them where they discussed these issues. So, yeah, but normally the like the main hosts are Adam and his wife Mary. They do the like opening part of it, and I guess sometimes they close too with some commentary. But they also have other segments they do. Yeah. Yeah, I should probably link to that, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think Adam will ever come back? <laughs> uh, I think so. I invited him to join us again, but he said he couldn't make it because he had a cold, so I guess I didn't even add him to the call because I'm assuming he wasn't going to make it. But, yeah, I don't think he was too – I think he understood that what happened last time was a little bit of an anomaly. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, look, it's it's not uh, it's it. There's no problem with having a good argumentative discussion about things. I think we should be able to have those discussions. Those discussions are important as long as they're conducted yeah. in a good fashion. That's you know we should we shouldn't ever kind of be leery of having uh, a kind of um, conflicting ideas because that that's going to help you develop your own your own ideas. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I've had disagreements with people before and certainly have changed my mind on things. Um, yeah. So I think that's important. You know, you don't want it to become too much of just like a self-enforced echo chamber where you can only have everybody sort of agreeing and nodding nodding along. <laughs> you know, it's good to have a disagreement yeah. occasionally if, if it's warranted. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I, I that... fully agree. I just think you have to... You have to um... I don't know. In a setting like this, you can't be absolutizing your position. You have to. You have yeah. to. Be, you have to be thinking. You're. You're offering a position in a space that is a, that is a common mm. shared space, and and it, it present your position without apology, but not. You know, there's no room yeah. for if we're coming from you know various traditions. There's no room for like hardcore pontification. I disagree. We all need a purity spiral. <laughs> <laughs> Holiness spiral. Well, I mean, I thought it would be interesting sometimes to like maybe have certain like I don't know debates maybe like where it would be sort of organized where we're not necessarily like just spontaneously like you know in a heated argument or whatever like where we could actually present it would be sort of organized where we could each or whoever's debating would participate and would like to get time to speak and present an argument and we could just kind of hear different thoughts on different things yeah that would be interesting I mean, it was more, it was like organized as a debate that might be a little bit more smooth. But if, when it's like people are kind of put on the spot, it kind of leaves people dumbfounded at times, I think. Has anybody been, anyone been following, am I allowed to introduce a, are we on a subject right now or are we sort of? Um, I mean, if you have something else you want to talk about, it, it's cool. Well, Unless anybody well, else we, has something they wanted to say about that. About well, the debating whatever. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, that, it was in that. It was on that lines. Actually, I was, I was moving. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Kind of Say whatever. Around. Yeah, no, I like that. I, I think that's a good idea. I don't know if anybody's been following because it reminded me of uh, what's been going on over at on TRS. There, uh, there's a guy there called um, Post Conservative who's a Catholic, trad Catholic. I think he might be in the SSP or I'm not sure SSXP or um, RPX. SSPX. SSSX. SSXP is a society of. Yes, it's yes. a diagnostics program. Yes, that's right. SSPX. <laughs> anyway, he's some form of trad Catholic. He's wrote two uh, two pieces on the Fatima um, visions. Oh, right. And, and then he wrote another piece just recently on uh, Keck and Christ, which was really more just about Christ. He didn't actually get into Keck much. Uh, just trying to say, he, he's just pushing for a... 
not pushing for, but just arguing for a space for uh, Christianity within the movement, uh, the broader movement, especially over there in TRS land. And mm -hmm. and immediately you got these, you know, the classic um, guys coming in basically saying that, you know, Christianity ruined everything and Christianity is the only cause. It's this this very simplistic view that, you know, if, the, if Europe had never gone Christian, you know, we'd all be in a, we'd be in a white Afghan state paradise right now. So, yeah. And I know. so I've been, I've been over there doing some smacking down a bit on these, some of these guys. And, but in, in a way that actually I brought some, some of them around because I, I was persistent, but without being just a troll and, and showing some agreement, you can find, you can gain, gain some ground. But anyway, that kind of debating is, I mean, this is a major, this is always a kind of a thorny issue. Um, and then we, you know, Christians versus, uh, you know, pagans or Nietzscheans. And then you have, um, you know, we have within our own selves, we have these, these conflicts of, uh, yeah. the, the one thing I always kind of, uh, I find is, is a good sort of argument against that is that, um, listen, if, if Christianity had not, um, taken root in Europe, um, you, you still like, there's not any, there's nothing I can particularly see that led from that to Muhammad. So you would have still had Islam come in. And I don't see any kind of evidence to suggest that Europe would have held up any better against Islam than, say, the um, the pagan uh, sort of areas. You know, Persia was Zoroastrianism, which was kind of essentially a type of paganism, and it didn't, you know, it didn't it didn't last long at all. This was a formerly great, mighty empire, much like the Roman Empire was, and that disintegrated. Um, and it didn't it didn't stand up against Islam. It it couldn't. It it fell. Uh, I don't. I don't see any evidence to to point to that the post fall of Rome, Europe, you know, as we know, Northern Europe was not at all very sort of civilized or had any sort of functioning civilization. Effectively, um, it would have just become Islamic. And you know, for those people who are very very much focused on the racial question, wherever Islam has taken over, it has been Arabized to to some to some extent. So. Mm -hmm. That's the future you'd be looking at. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, and, and also, you know, who was when Romans are killing Goths and Visigoths and other barbarians, it's it's essentially white people killing white people. So you don't have Oh yeah, the power. whole the whole white people killing white people so that predates Christianity by a long time, so that's just yeah. kind of yeah. a stupid argument. No more yes. brothers war. <laughs> and you know, but yeah. I don't understand why that's uh, like and I, I, I get I guess this feeds back into the kind of Americanism because TRS is very American, of course, and I'm sure all these comments are American. They really don't understand that this whole white focus does not really translate onto Europe. It barely translates today, let alone a thousand years ago. If you'd have gone back a thousand years ago and gone into Poland and said, Hello, my white brothers, you know, they wouldn't have known what the fuck you were talking about. <laughs> it's you this know, and it, you know it's it stinks of a kind of modern view of this kind of globalized world because guess what this is the case everywhere this is the case in asia this is the case in africa they don't all see themselves as you know in africa they don't all see themselves as one black you know one hey, one wait. africa one united africa gaddafi tried to do that and was not very successful um you know they they hate you <laughs> they they have these tribal loyalties uh, to themselves because they didn't all develop the same same in asia you know japan look at japanese and chinese they can loathe each other you know there's no asian oh we must be have asian solidarity that doesn't really exist this is very much it's a product of the fact that americans because obviously they have uh, they're just sort of the product of various waves of europeans from different places and then they don't really have a sort of uh, a common like root somewhere um, like maybe you could say Australians do with English. Americans yeah. don't necessarily have that. And thus they have to sort of identify as, well, we're white vis-a-vis, -vis, obviously, black Americans. But we it, are white it has Americans. Translated and they right. apply that to Europe, and it's, it's, it doesn't what? apply. We're but white. it has... White. We are white people. You know, we are white. It Europe doesn't have relevance to Europe. Oh. They've adopted it in kind of an unhealthy way in, uh, in that... I mean, you kind of get this kind of supercilious uh, thing from certain, especially certain countries in Europe, that they're they're gonna they're gonna do the race thing even better than the Americans, 
but they hate their <laughs> European. Well, no, the, the whole love white thing every other Europe isn't import. In. It's imported from America. This the, the kind that? of like, oh, you tick white on a census. Like I'm white. I remember white British. Like, hot. What the, the fuck? Is... What? White. Yeah. We are white. 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 I remember uh, white there's people. there's a recent article on Amron talking about this. Uh, I, I wish I could remember the name of the guy, but he was I think he was part of the uh, the U.S. Navy back in the 1800s, and he actually went to China during the Opium Wars to just sort of observe what was going on between the British and the Chinese, and and like he wasn't supposed to be involved with the war. He was just kind of observing it, but but the Chinese were winning, and he said something like, "Well, I'm gonna be damned if I'm gonna watch white men get slaughtered," and he like mm. joined in the fighting and helped the British win, and. Uh, so, like, back in the 1800s, it, was, it seemed like they had a concept of being white men. But, yeah. but again, that guy was American, so figures that that would be where the concept came from. That's good yeah, article, I mean, though. Christianity <laughs> provided, really, for Europe, like, the ability to kind of transcend that and, you know, possibly come together, but not in a racial sense. It was, it was superficially racial in the fact that, obviously, you know, people have a common sort of spiritual... Uh, understanding Mun, so you know, ostensibly white people, um, but ultimately it was a religious thing that societies were based on a common religious root, and thus they did have things in common. Whereas before this wasn't the case. I mean, the, the contrast between Roman Empire, Southern Europe, and Northern Empire, uh, you know, basically s snow huts and and spears, was huge. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just couldn't compare them. Whereas it was very easy to compare, like, I don't know, medieval Russia to medieval France. There are a lot of comparisons you can draw there, uh, you know, civilizationally. And it's because they had, did have a kind of common root. Didn't stop wars, didn't stop bloodshed at all because of all the sort of theopolitical intrigues that uh, went on, especially after the schism of Christianity. But um, it, it, did, it did provide at least a basis, a possible basis, a potentiality for understanding among white people uh because it, I, I don't think americans really get that you know there is a psychology there's a psychological aspect to race as well as biological and race you know eth different ethnic groups within white they don't necessarily think the same russians don't think the same yugoslavia french people is yeah and yugoslavia great example of that um you know they're all white why are they wanting to cut each other's heads off it's uh it, you know, there has to be a kind of, there's a spiritual, psychological dimension to these things. It's not just this kind of pure biology. And I think, you know, whenever I read these kind of American alt-right commentaries on Europe, I do get a little triggered by it. I sort of wonder, <laughs> they're, they're really trying to stretch out that the American paradigm, apply it to Europe. And it, I, I can tell you just from being it, it doesn't apply. It doesn't work. If it if it worked, if that worked, then the um, the the European right would have been successful far far earlier. You know, would have been successful way back in the probably like the seventies because we all would have come together across the whole continent. Um, but they never. They've always been divided. Always. Nationalists in, in uh, Romania hate nationalists in Hungary. That's <laughs> this is the case. I remember Ramsey Paul talked about. Uh... He's trying to explain yeah. white nationalism to a Hungarian or somebody a Romanian. Or in Romania. It was in Romania, yeah, and, and they were like, "What the hell are you talking about?" <laughs> no, he was saying that like, like, so what is, so what does it mean to be white? And he's like, "Well, you know, like, like, white people, like, me. It's like, so would that include like, uh, that would include like, British, like, oh, okay, like, include Germans, oh, okay, that would include Russians, like, what, Russians? Yeah, screw that." <laughs> Yeah, Russians are <laughs> Mongols. Like, Italians aren't white. Oh yeah, Italians aren't really white. Who's oh, white? Irish. Irish aren't really white. They're mixed. <laughs> they have Iberian. They have Iberian genes. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the great the great thing about having like uh, the Russian uh, Russian ethnic uh, base in in my family is that um, you know when when anyone says, "Oh, you're actually Asian." You're actually, you're actually got that Mongol DNA. I can always say, okay, but well, if you kick us out, you've got to kick the Finns out too, because the Finns have like seventy percent Mongol DNA. Yeah, they really. Russians only got about like twenty, like less than twenty percent, I think. Finns, yeah, it's it's. How does that work? Seventy percent. 
so they're 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 part of the invasion, and then they were sort of isolated geographically after. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yep. Interesting. I don't believe it's due to like in like breeding with them or anything. I think it is just they were left behind, and then eventually over time, there's kind of like um, I guess there was some kind of interbreeding with maybe Nordics as well and Germanics and and Russians certainly, and then they ended up with this kind of finno ergic type people. Mm-hmm. Hungarians as well. I mean, Magyars are not, uh, you know, they've they've got a lot more ethnically in common with Turks than they do with, um, say, their nearest neighbors like Poles and things. So, you know, there you go. Yeah, but we're, it can't, I guess it we can't just to... be genetic. Is my point? No, no. I think we'll have to come There's up more so... esoteric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, Mark, when you talk about alt-right commentaries on Europe, are you thinking of people like Richard Spencer? Like his kind of Well, not just Richard vision? Spencer. I think there are many, many others who have this kind of vision. And you, I mean, you're talking about the people who are on the comment section in TRS. I mean, I don't give that stuff any kind of intellectual credibility, really. Because... I don't read the comments on TRS not, very I'm not, often. I'm not knocking it's TRS, but it's a, it's a platform for entertainment, really more than more than much else i mean daily shower and things these are entertaining things these are not like um you know this is not like social matter or something like that it's um a lot of it is meant to uh and then justifiably well, yeah. so you know provide some entertainment for people and as such uh, i think some of the people it attracts are more sort of poll you know people who browse poll and and uh, like trolling people on youtube and that's not i know that's in the alt right but it's not like the people who actually sort of inform the ideology that's just sort of just the you know the meme team <laughs> yeah hmm. well on the daily show they do sometimes get into like metapolitical theories and things like that it can be hmm. not purely entertainment but it's done in sort of a laid-back way that it's kind of accessible to average the average person i mean it's very edgy it's trying to be it's trying to be kind of edgy with its with its humor and things which i don't think is the case for all outlets um, like, I mean, even take something like Richard Spencer's Radix. I mean, that's not, it's a very different type of feel, you know, it's much more sort of yeah. serious and ac- trying to be academic with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, Richard Spencer is in there as somebody who's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Richard Spencer's got some very ass backward ideas about, uh, how Europe actually really works and, you know, what's possible. I mean, he dreams of some kind of pan white Roman empire. Mer, Mer new Roman Empire. Yeah, not in your lifetime, Richard, I'm afraid. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> well, I don't know if you think it's going to be his lifetime necessarily, but I don't know. Uh, United I Land believe. from. It Black could happen, Boston but it would be like Lisbon. a thousand years away. A thousand years. I mean, for crying out loud, you can't really be talking about, like, in one sentence, we're, we're on the verge of genocide, and then talk in the next sentence about, oh, yeah, we could actually build a new Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> like a big, there's a big gulf between those two things. You got to kind of, you know, climb the the Yuga wheel at least. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like I don't know. I was, I used to read Red X Journal a lot. I don't. I mean, I still have it in my feed. Leave a lot of times the articles in there. I just skip them because they don't interest me. And I used to listen. Mm. To there's the been podcast. some really good stuff there. There has been some really good stuff already. But there's also been some utter shite <laughs> that I've read on there. Um, so, you know, it's a mixed bag, but I, I, I do appreciate that he, um, I think he publishes people who kind of disagree with him as well and disagree with each other, which is a, a benefit. It's an asset to him. I think there's some, there's yeah. some good stuff on Radix. People should check it out. Yeah. I just remember I used to listen to the podcast. That was before I think TRS was really a thing. So I was just trying to find like alternative media to listen to. And I don't know. I just, a lot of times they were just talking about movies and things like that, which I didn't really, I'd never seen the movies, so it was kind of like just listening to hear their thoughts on stuff, but I don't know, I kind of lost interest in a lot of the podcasts because I felt they were just not really my thing. So, now I listen to tons of podcasts, they're mostly from like like Social Matter or for TRS or places like that, so, or on YouTube when I have the time. Mm. Did you guys listen to the uh, on subject Richard Spencer and TRS? Did you hear the thing the other day with uh, it was it was Mike Enoch, Richard Spencer, and Andrew Anglin at like a lampshades thing? 
Oh, they had Andrew Anglin on with Richard Spencer? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't have recommended that. But... <laughs> I, what, is there something between them? I don't really... No, like, it's just guys... Andrew Anglin is... Um, he is ostensibly quite a sort of 1488 type. So, I don't, And I think he does it... In a, I don't know what the hell his game is. I don't... I, I can't decipher Andrew Anglin, really. Uh, he's linked to me like... uh, reasonably. So, you know, I haven't got really? a problem with him, but I think his... I don't know if his and Spencer's um, agendas necessarily gel with one another. <laughs> they actually, it was actually, it was actually a pretty good discussion. It seemed like they were, they got along all right. Like, uh, like they were on the same page for the most part. But yeah, excuse me. Like, uh, I remember they were kind of saying at the beginning of it, like, like if you, you never thought you'd see the three of us together or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But, it's just like Richard Spencer know, doesn't say like. Gas the kikes race war now. Gas the kikes race war now. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah they were talking about. England was kind of talking a little bit about what his sort of a strategy is. Like he says, his, he kind of tries to appeal to like young edgy people, and I guess yeah. that's kind of. And hey, look, give credit I to him. This is the cheek, most visited site on the ostensible alt right or whatever. In yeah. terms of hits, in terms of clicks, he does get the. Uh, the most uh, because he is outrageous he is you know he's living on the very edge uh i don't necessarily you know that's not a tactic i'd necessarily adopt but um yeah you know i, would, I wouldn't I lump him it, in with it has a best before date what's that 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 tactic is not a it's not a long-term strategy well, that's the thing. I yeah. think he thinks it is, and I, I don't. I disagree. I don't. Th you know, I think even the, even the slightly less edgy. Mark. Even like, I like you photo for a second there. oh, sorry. Even like, uh, like photoshopping people into gas chambers and things during the campaign. <laughs> uh, you, you know that that has its, uh, that has its kind of sell by date. And in, if you don't have a plan beyond that, then you're you're not going to get any further. Than that. Yeah. I'll yeah, be honest, I don't really read the Daily Stormer that much, so I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily hold Anglin in high regard, although he seems like a reasonably intelligent guy. That's what I mean. I, yeah, and he's not, he's know, not like, like um, I, I wouldn't put him in the camp of um, 1488. Renegator. Type. Yeah, I was thinking of those, those retards came to mind. Um, because, I mean, Andrew Anglin, the, the article that he, and it gave me a huge amount of hits, actually, that he... Um, cited in, in, in like an article of his own, he talked about it, gave a, gave a little commentary on the article, was an article uh, that happened after Roosh V got, you remember when Roosh V organized that worldwide, like guys get together at bars and just talk yeah, yeah, yeah. about like, women, and then like there was an entire sort thing, of, like yeah. Australia tried to deploy their navy to stop him entering, and Britain banned him and all this other stuff, and I even I our little article, town, they were Even our little town, they yeah, were, gonna, they they were, were gonna absolutely going nuts in Canada and things. And I posted an article <laughs> saying, you know, this this, this is the beginning of like a, a crackdown, a general kind of crackdown on even like anything mildly controversial. Um, what is and is there something? That's not me. Louie. So is Louie. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. What do you hey, Chinese think guy. about the... <laughs> So I to I'm just going to mute you for a moment yeah, here. You, you, you for a second while he's getting uh, told off by his mother. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what I, what I was saying was he, like I was just saying, you know, this is quite important. This is an important seminal event. And Andrew Anglin commented on it saying, yeah, that's actually right. Um, you know, whereas I think like Renegade would have said, oh, fucking hell, Roosh V, he's a fucking, like, he's Arabian or something, you know, he's, like, wants to rape white women he's or something. So, and Andrew Anglin didn't go down that route. He actually said, yeah, you know, we're, we're kind of sort of in the same deplorables basket, at least for now, and yeah, we do need to see this as a kind of signal that they are actually kind of going nuts, and there may be more kind of censorship on the internet in the future. Uh, and this may have presaged things like um, Richard Spencer's temporary being kicked off Twitter, which has since been reinstated. But other people haven't, of course, mm -hmm. um, like Pax Dickinson and other people. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I respect that about Anglin. He seems to be willing to work. He, he, I mean, he seems to have a kind of willingness to work with a, lot, a wide degree of people. What I would say is, I, I'm not. Uh, a fan of necessarily his like 
his tactics and I'm not 100% sure of his motivations uh, as such because of the tactics he uses. He seems to sort of, um, like, I don't know if any of you guys know this, but like when the alt, when the alt right was very much becoming like a big thing, he relabeled his site um, the biggest alt right website <laughs> on the net, yeah, even he, though he, he, you know, he hadn't it, right? ever been. You know, he'd never been to NPI. He hadn't been in with the people who were really sort of pushing the alt-right label. And then after Trump won, he changed it to the premier Republican Party website. Yeah. <laughs> ever. So, like, because Trump is now, you know, the, the Repu- we, we the Republicans now. Um, so he, he seems to be sort of, like, jumping around to where he can we kind of pull in and, and appeal to most people. But, it's uh, of course, still the site is bedecked with... Uh, swastikas and shlomos and things so yeah i mean you know i don't know it's hard to decrypt for me but i think yeah you kind of get where i'm coming from i feel like sorry william you were saying something or oh you were you were so i just was i was just trying to carry on ian oh i was just gonna say like i i find him some of his stuff like i don't know if he's like, i've read some of the articles, I don't read the Daily Stormer that often. I check it out every once in a while, just because somebody might link to it or something. But like, I remember when he said like the number one alt right site. There's a picture of a swastika next to it. And it's like you know we've been trying to tell people we're not Nazis, but it's like when you yeah, put that yeah. up there, exactly. it's like makes it easy to it's like. I'm like, I mean, I'm yeah, idiots on Twitter saying, well, you're part of the alt right. That must mean you like Hitler. It's like, well, no, not really. I'm just I'm not a national socialist or anything. I'm just, I just, I just want, you know, I just love my people. That's not. That's what it's about. It's not like I'm. I don't think we need to start. Not not when these people think that you're a cuck unless you want to exterminate every Jew from the face of the earth. I mean, no, like that kind of I thing. Don't think but, really realistically, <laughs> thinks that it may, apart from maybe the people at Renegade. Um, you know, yeah. we're just we are. I mean, we're red pilled on the JQ surrounding like people like Kurt Eichenwald having a seizure on his carpet, but uh, you know, we're not like like I said, we're not like those kind of crazy people who think that. Yeah. Who think that things like lying was invented by the Jew? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's I'm serious. That is what Sinead, you know, Sinead McCarthy, Shiksa Goddess, actually said in a video, saying white people didn't used to lie to each other. The Jew made us lie to each other. I was like, well, you, you know, seriously think that we didn't lie to each other? The like, serpent the was the Chris. most subtle I think... of the animals, and he was a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying, Louis? What animal? Oh, the, the the serpent was the most subtle of all the animals in the garden, and he was a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the Korean I think, language no, is I a word think, for I think Putin animals. was the serpent. Oh, what? yeah. He's behind I Putin, everything. I think Putin must be the serpent. He must have been back. <laughs> he must be. Time traveling is Putin. <laughs> I, I mean, with England, you got you got to listen to you got to you got to read. I mean, if it's worth your time, but he is sort of a he is sort of a thing. It's not like he doesn't matter in a way. Um, you have to you have to listen through, and you, generally speaking, when he's having a conversation with somebody, like he did in this recent uh, triumvirate conversation with Spencer and and Enoch and him, he talks pretty straight up. Like he talks about what he thinks. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I think he's. I, an I kind of guy. wish. I kind of wish that maybe on the and now on the site too. So every once in a while he'll get serious, and he's he's he very much puts it. He's very much uh, against degeneracy. He doesn't. Uh, he actually was the one uh, speaking against uh, abortion. The only one of those three on that on that interview. The rest, the other two, were willing. Were yeah, I, I, well, I, I definitely respect him for that. And so but... he actually has a kind of he has a moral core. It's just like you say, it's a bit hard. But what you have to do is li- you have to listen to him when he's just you know when when Andrew the troll isn't trolling and he's actually speaking what he thinks. Yeah, yeah. I think he's probably also respect him. him when he's when he's like that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, you know, he's not a bad. He's not a bad guy. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think. But we have to. I think we're well, gonna all that. We're, we're gonna have to come. We're gonna have to come to terms with this cack thing sometime, though. I think as Christians, these people who think that they can create a god, right? <laughs> revive I, I mean, a god. I just, and that's that's I, every bit as serious before. as our two thousand year old tradition. I don't think anybody takes the keck thing seriously. I, I maybe it's I'm wrong. Meme. Oh, I think you're Does wrong. Does anyone I think, think it's wrong. not just a meme? Is anyone seriously I mean, talking to people who don't have 
a tradition or a background or a history more meaningful than anything they've engaged before. So I, I have to disagree with you. I think it's actually, it, 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 they actually consider it to be analogous to Christianity. Okay, no, wait, wait. Do you, do you think that the hmm. people who like troll mess, message boards on 4chan and things that they believe in Keck no, in the no, same no, no, way no. that we believe in like Jesus or uh, Hindus <laughs> believe in like Ganesh? I, I honestly cannot comprehend that that would ever be possible unless somebody was mentally ill. That they actually uh, would think that that's I think real. I think, it, I think there's. I think it's some lies somewhere between those two extremes, and and it does kind of create this this sense of, um, it's a substitute, and they think that it is a sufficient substitute because to them it's just a game. You just need a a symbol to rally under. Well, that's and the thing. I'm, I'm sort of saying sort it's of just a game. With it's language. Not it's not real it's i mean this is just for them it's like a Video it's a troll game. it's a troll thing think what we do is real either so it's they, it doesn't need to be real right and, and some people you know love well no but no 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 okay they don't think what, what we do is real necessarily but they they believe that we believe it's real if they, if you can follow that whereas yeah, they just you think know we're, i mean what's the i can't take between... that that seriously at all that anyone actually you know well, you're, you're misunderstanding me but that's okay Oh, am I? I just, I'm trying to understand. I just want to see a, a, a video of someone preaching a sermon against the dangers of keck worship. <laughs> Probably some cock... Uh, oh, there, were, there are. There have priest. been some. I, I, I'm imagining oh. it's some cock Protestant priest. Or a okay, I, I'm or, just keeping... Or, I'm, for now, what just do they keeping call their I'm just Lawrence, Lawrence, Murray's, Lawrence Murray's last piece on the Exodus and on at TRS somebody was totally triggered that he was basically pushing a false god so this is a <laughs> this is a thing i mean it, that's the reaction but um anyway you're just talking what about the that? comment section what's that william you, you're referring to the trs comment section yeah in the people always get triggered by it in the disc they've been doing that for years the trs comment section has so many cranks that I don't even really read the comments most of the time because it seems like most of the yeah. responses are stupid. But like I remember last year there was there was some pro Christian stuff, then you have all these Fedora tipping fourteen eighty eighters like getting angry about it and like and I think they even took down an article because it was just causing so much anger. Like it's just like why could you like I don't know. I feel like like I look at TRS as being sort of like a sort of an open forum. For a lot of different viewpoints, so they're not. It's not necessarily like one ideology that they adhere to. Like they kind of just. I think there's also a lot of teenage. To. It's also quite teenage in terms of the comment section, and you've got to bear in mind that that's just a reflection of general American kind of teendom. Is that you know teens just generally are like that? You can find those kind of same reactions on normal comment sections and normal websites. Well, so, even some of the. Uh... Writers are uh, pretty young, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a youth to it. And look, I'm not, I'm not some old, uh, old sage or anything. Certainly not. But uh, I've certainly advanced beyond that. Uh, oh, yeah. the sort of the teen years. <laughs> I know Lawrence Murray in his recent article he said, "Ah, the 1980s were great," or just something like, "Ah, the 1980s mm -hmm. must have been great." I wish I'd been alive for them. And I was like, "Wow, I didn't realize he was that young." <laughs> <laughs> It's I always say 1980 all over again, folks. I, I always say like the 1380s would have been great. It's a shame I didn't live through them. <laughs> yes, 13. Oh yes, uh, the 1380s had the 1381 uh, peasants' rebellion in England, uh, in which people went and uh, burned government records and stuff. It would have been it would have been fun. Oh bloody hell, Louis <laughs> on his English history there. I didn't even know that. So. <laughs> There you go. Uh, and that was also the time of the Western Schism, if I'm not uh, correct. 1380. Uh, I don't know. I knew in the late that might have been around that 14th time. century was, was the Western Schism. Bit... Well, it's it's never clear when these uh, when exactly these schisms. Well, are, yeah, it's like uh... when did the East-West Schism happen? <laughs> 
<laughs> there's, uh, there's differing accounts. Yeah. Ten forty six, but there's like all of these other events. There's all these other events, and eventually right. they um, it's it's actually quite a while before they just completely stop talking to each other. <laughs> For a while, they're still. Um, a lot of sources are saying 1054 is when the East West Schism happened. Uh, oh, 1054. Yeah, 1054. Yeah, like somebody's saying Orini made a video about Keck. Like, I, I, maybe I just don't get it, but I'd, I'd never make a, an art. I'd never write an article about Keck. Honestly, I would never, because it's just, I just yeah. see it as a. It's, a, it's and I don't say this disparagingly, but I, I just see it as technically a, a joke it's like a, it's a funny joke between people like they say are you know keck keck the god of uh, chaos is sowing chaos in the hillary clinton campaign <laughs> and it's, yeah i mean that's know. how i see it too it's just kind of a it's kind of a yeah. it's sort of like an internal meme that we yeah. i'm like the whole thing with pepe the frog i mean like for a long time i'm like what is this what does Pepe even represent? Yeah. Like, it's and just kind of like a way of for people to people wink at each applied, other. Sort of. People have applied like magical significance to a 1980s Italo disco record called Chatelet because it was by an artist yeah, Pepe that and had a, had a frog on the front. I mean, this is not a religion. This is not a cult. This is not like David Koresh and his compound. This is people fucking sending memes over the internet. People shouldn't get worked up about it and be all, uh, you know, like oh shit oh no heresy it's it's well, that, that that that's not joke, my guys. that's not my thing at all about it like i i'm seeing it more as just uh anyway it'd be a it's a I'll, I'll, maybe i'll do a blog post on it don't do a blog post on it jeez do not do that it doesn't require a blog post it's a meme <laughs> People Why are just, not? you know, they're screwing around. If yep. there's any, if there's anyone out there who is like using Keck as a substitute for anything, and by that I mean they legitimately like think about Keck outside of trolling and outside of alt right. I think that's when you know something is taken off as a kind of like substitute cult or substitute religion is where they think about it outside of the context where it was originally founded in. So like if they're thinking about Keck when they're like tweeting or posting on 4chan fine but if they're thinking about it when they're making breakfast in the morning thinking oh yeah well, i wonder what like uh, keck would be saying about this you know that's when you know <laughs> if there's anyone who's actually doing that then i think that they're a mentally disturbed individual and you know probably should be a uh, sort of sectioned maybe uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's just not it's not worth thinking about really it's uh, it's silliness uh, certainly uh, not worth I, it i beg to differ but i i i i i well, I await your, your oh, like, lengthy blog post on on Keck and, <laughs> and many forms. Yeah, of I'm, I'm I'm trying. Tribute. I'm interested in hearing what your uh, theory is exactly, William. Because I guess I'm not completely sure of what you're getting at. But I mean, if you can, if you uh, can... I would take me. I would, it, no, no, I don't think we'll waste time on it here. Okay. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll wait I'll... for the wait for the article. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. Anyway, it's a subtle thing, but it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I, I'm just. I'm seeing the future. You're and, seeing, you're seeing the future. Murder. The future looks like shrines to frogs. <laughs> are you saying that, like, well, are you saying that, like, you think that even if it's not like seen as a religion now, it could kind of develop into something sort of like an actual religion, or like? No, I just think. I just think. I think that in. I think that in a postmodern world where people have been completely. Uh, well, the, the, Deluded of religion. What of deracination is. That it doesn't yeah. take very much for them to think they're engaging in something that is equal to and therefore deserves the same. Uh, and I'm not meaning like deserves the same as in it's a god versus a god. I just mean in terms of in in this in this in this social sphere in which we talk, it it begins to to have a kind of uh, equal weight. Um, but it, like I say, it would take me longer to develop it. But it's it's just a, it's just an intuition I have. It's not a it's not a. Um, it, are you thinking of how like some people will like start these weird cults and claim that they deserve legal recognition as a religion or that kind of thing? No, no, it's way it's way less developed than that. It's just in our conversations with each other in this sphere, um, that it, I just see it as I just see it already kind of in places. Is but I don't have an example right in front of me right now. Would it be I like if there was it, a I see, it becoming an, I see it becoming an impediment, as well as a kind of arrogance. You combine that with this kind of Nietzschean will to power, and it just ends up being a, a kind of a mm. dominating will. It's nothing to do with Keck being a god or Pepe being an actual avatar or anything. It's just to do with 
the will of a hu of the human being. Look at, let me oh, let me ask I've him something. That's, can you can you foresee like a situation where you'd have like a conversation with somebody and you'd be like joking around and Keck would come up and they, this person would get very like serious about it, like oh don't joke about Keck seriously. You no like, no 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 fuck no, you like don't that. joke about Keck. <laughs> I just see, I just see it as providing uh, providing more justification for will to power in in a weird yeah. kind of fucked up. Post well, that way, I'm that not I, that I can agree with. That I actually person. agree with. It, I'm just saying, it offers it it in that in a very concrete way. It's just a, um, like I said, it's it's like uh, it's just another form of narrative. It's another kind of rhetorical tool. But I agree with you that it, there exactly. is this kind of will to power. Um, it's necessitated by the way the alt right functions and the way that it has actually succeeded in doing what it wants to do. Um, yeah, Kaka's I've said just ultimately, really on I don't top think that's of that. Jack yeah. is sort of add an additive on top of the Nietzschean will to power versus Keck is some kind of real religion. It's just, mm. it's just says, Oh, you got your God. We've got a God, you know, and then this kind of smarmy yeah, world yeah. We live in that can be that. really problematic. Well, I don't think it's going to be that the text chat. for us. Anyway, the text I, chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, Rooster got this. People who frog post should be burned at the stake as heretics. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Burned. I, th burned I think this is. I think the alt-right is divided into people who are going to get serious at some point, and people who just won't. And I think the people who are kind of like constantly sort of kept posting probably are the people who won't get serious. Who for the for them this will be just kind of like a fad. This will be like a phase that they went through, and then they'll get a job or you know get a girlfriend. They'll do something. Um, you know, you got to remember yeah. for any kind of political movement, you won't have a number of people who just kind of drop off of it. Who just kind of yeah. move on, and yeah. I think that a lot of the these kind of sort of shit posters who've become invested in the Trump campaign, those are the people who are going to drop off. It's it's going to be the thinkers and, and people like that that are going to are going to stay on, you know, until the bitter end. We got to start the legionaries. Yeah, yeah, you know, well, the, people, I... the people who are of an incorrect, uh, you know, matter. Eventually, when you have organizations and things. They're the people who will just, they will eventually walk away of their own accord. They'll have other things to do with them. They're, they're looking for something else that you, you just won't end up providing for them. Yeah, yeah. And if it, yeah it, it, I mean, if you, were to, if you were to run this thing through the filter of a firing squad, probably uh, Neo Reaction would be the, the last people standing. <laughs> Everyone um, else would flee. <laughs> Well, no, I just mean that there's, you know, it's not even, you know, it's not that extreme, but there, I think there's a, there's, there's people who for this, for them, this is very serious. And then there's people for whom this is kind of a, a, a laugh, you know, this is something that's yeah. kind of fun. I kind of agree with it in a, in a sort of intellectual sense. Uh, you know, maybe I do agree with this, this stuff about white identity or whatever, but really, you know, I'm not actually, I wouldn't ever give anything for this. You know, if, if, they, if they asked me to deny it, I would deny it in a heart. There's, you know, there's those kinds of, I think that that's, that makes up a scary, scary amount of people on, on the alt right who for that, for them, this is just kind of a, an exercise, a mental exercise, a way to put off, you know, blow off steam, which really encompasses what 4chan was originally about. You know, what, whatever has actually come out of 4chan, it's just a, a way people you know, waste time waste time in their lives that they've got spare. Yeah. Mm. Well, the other boys aren't saying much. You know, uh, the loudmouths have been talking. <laughs> <laughs> My loudmouth is... No, it's talking. okay. Well, I actually have to go. Time. I have to actually go soonish tonight because we have a yeah same. We have a goy a, a goy gathering at my house tonight. So oh oh nice yeah goys <laughs> the goys goys are getting together. You're oh, I, don't like, I, don't, I don't like it when goys get together. They could be planning something. You know, like like <laughs> not even so they, they could be planning not to take out a consumer loan. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hate play. crime. You know, I, I'm the subject of. You know, it's funny. I actually tried to what? talk about the jig with my father the other day, and it, it was kind of oh, weird. <laughs> but no, like he was talking about how, uh, like, we were 
just talking about like how there's a lot of degeneracy out there. He's like, you know, we really need to have a, a culture, a Christian culture, where we all agree that Christianity is good. And I thought, and I just thought, hey, this is an opportunity to bring this up. I'm like, well, do you think that then, if you want a Christian culture, that means we would have to ha- exclude Jews because I mean they're not Christians? And he, and he's like, I feel like my father's kind of like he's sort of red pill on the JQ, but he doesn't want to be. So like he wants to be a finalist <laughs> someday. So he. So he like always will try to make excuses for them, even though he kind of, yeah, he's like big on like Israel and stuff. But, but uh, like I don't know. I feel like he kind of knows, but he just doesn't want to know. Like he, like he, he wants to, he wants to be starts knocking back the blue pills as soon as he. Yeah, basically, and I, I, I talk about how like well, yeah, they got a strong tribal identity, and oftentimes that works against us. He's like, yeah, well, they have to do that because they're a small minority. I'm like, well, yeah, but if it's working against our interests, then us. So, I mean, like, I don't know. I, 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 I have to sort to wear him down sometimes with that stuff. I think he will get it eventually if he lets himself. Yeah, you just got to really wear at them. Just get at their ends, wear down their sort of defenses of my freedom. Have you been successful with that lightning patriot? Uh, it's... I, I see signs in doing it. It's usually through sort of memeing and signaling. You eventually wear down the barriers. It's it been successful. Movie Red Pill. Life. What's that, Louie? Just shitpost in real life. All the time. Yeah, well, yeah, I wonder an example is what made me Red Pill is, was mostly through signaling over time on the internet. <laughs> eventually you're like yeah Muslims are shits <laughs> mostly I learned that but I eventually learned everything else through just signaling over time you eventually snap yeah. saying you know yeah race matters <laughs> race is a yeah. it, it's a factor mm-hmm. then eventually when I came over to the alt-right eventually called over to like fascism or neo-reaction those are quite different uh, branches. I see there's a lot of similarities. There's, there seems to be kind of a difference over names and maybe some of the actions on how power should be attained. Mm. Mm. Tactics. Exactly. Tactics, yeah. Seems to be the major difference. Yeah. Yeah, and it just, I mean, there's a slight difference, I think, in the the outcomes in in many ways. I don't think like yeah. Rich Spencer's outcome is as um, resplendent as as perhaps uh, you know somebody like a uh, uh, a Mark Ure or or somebody you know one of these other writers. Um, because I think that, and they were just talking about this in the a Skype group I was in. Um, uh, the common like NRX slogan is the only morality is is civilization, whereas a common like alt right mm-hmm. slogan is the only morality is survival, and those two are kind of different. <laughs> and I've said I, I don't actually use that uh, NRX slogan because it, I don't like the way it's formulated. It sounds a little Hobbesian, um, like the sort of Leviathan, like you know, society is the only reason we exist. Um, there is more to it than that, but I I do agree with its foundation vis a vis the alt right in that. Um, survival is only really valuable for humans in terms of what you do with it. Uh, you know, yeah. to, to just say survival for survival's sake reduces you to the level of an insect or a, you know, a plant. It's a beast. That's in well, human. It's not, mm-hmm. yeah. do, do, do you, can I ask you a question about Hobbes, uh, Mark? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, just, I was having a chat a while ago on one of these, uh, one, anyway, one of the groups I'm on. And they were, somebody was talking about Hobbes and basically, uh, oh, because somebody put out an article recently, like Hobbes was the first uh, alt writer or something, or the proto alt writer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that. Yeah. And you, maybe it was you then that, that had said, because you were just speaking a little bit disparagingly of him, that he was actually the beginning of the, of, of, of the problem. Is that, am I remembering? He wasn't right the beginning on? of the problem. He was one of those philosophers that I think formulated things in an incorrect way. Um, 
he, he certainly wasn't as wrong as um, Locke. Locke was mm-hmm. far worse. And, and by the way, I think Locke was actually far more influential than Hobbes was, although people seem to randomly forget Locke more than they do Hobbes. Although, um, which probably is why he's more... People are inherently more good with inalienable rights. Well, the, the thing is, they both agreed on a certain thing, and that was that the, they both agreed on uh, that there was a state of nature in which man was uncivilized. And the, this is a common theme for right. both. They, they disagree on what that looks like. They disagree on what the state of nature looks like. But the, the fault in both of them is the idea that the state of nature ever existed. That there, were, there really was no state of nature. Um, before oh, I wonder who told them that, the state of nature. <laughs> well, I mean, the state of nature seems to be this, this period where we are living organically. We're living as we should live. Uh, you know, without any kind of indoctrination or presuppositions about the world. We live in this kind of bestial state with no civilization. And, and then we, dis- we decide yeah. to make civilization um, consciously as a kind of like decision uh, or a committee or something. We, we come together and uh, we form a, either a social contract or we decide that uh, life is just, it's too unbearable in the state of nature. You know, in the words of Hobbes, it's kind of Excellent. brutish and short. Yeah. And so we need, we need, we need civilization. We need society. We need uh, to have that kind of the Leviathan for ourselves. So that, so that our lives are bearable. Um, and I think the reactionary kind of disagrees with the basic premise. I think the reactionary says that uh, for human beings, civilization is as natural as um, the, the ant hill is for the ant and, and the beehive is for the bee. It's, we are social creatures and given our higher intellect and our, uh, the spiritual aspect of what, as well of human beings, uh, we are, we naturally build civilizations. The only thing that stops us building civilizations, especially, you know, if you go back to this early, his, this period of early history, which is deemed to be the state of nature, the reason that we didn't build civilization were due to constraints on our behavior by climate, by predators, um, you know, by other sort of factors, which as soon as those factors were no longer the case, we set up static agriculture. You know, we built civilizations just as birds build nests i mean that's what we did uh we're not i don't think humans can be said to naturally be these kind of like spider-like entities who individualistically go around uh killing each other wanton with you know abandon and i i just don't think that i don't think that's a real thing that ever existed or even existed in a me- in a metaphysical sense it's uh it's a faulty assumption around human nature i think for, to, for me at least and this relates to kind of that idea of civilization is the only morality um is that i believe civilization or our will to create civilization is a reflection of the image of day our will to create hierarchy is a reflection of the fact that there is a hierarchy in heaven and we have that we have that kind of heavenly imprint upon ourselves through the image of day uh, at least that's how i see it and that's one you- of the things that the alt-right kind of gets wrong with survival is that's all there is it's a very darwinian type of uh, viewpoint a pure darwinian uh, understanding of survival of the fittest how, how would you how would you look at the uh, eden in that context in the fall mm. well i mean eden's uh, interesting because eden uh, eden is definitely not like a, a state of nature because it's certainly not nasty british and short is it uh, it's no. idyllic it's it's wonderful um eden is this kind of i don't know it's very uh, <laughs> You you descend back into the period where myth and uh, reality kind of there's no difference really between them, as Evola said, and and so when you're talking about Eden, you're talking about a kind of semi-spiritual type of existence where we lived in complete sort of communion with God and uh, you know existed in this very idyllic state before there were any um, you know constraints constraints upon us. And bear in mind, in Eden there were only two. You know, there weren't like thousands of people there you had to organize. It was just two people. Uh, and thus, um, you know, I, I don't see that as being analogous to the state of nature at all. That's like the creation mm. period. Like, and then as, as soon as we fall, then we are, you know, we, we then to go about our business, which is the building of civilization and trying to uh, reflect what is above us as best as we can in a flawed way, of course. When the when the kids were younger and the and some of them were older and some of them were younger, the younger ones would still like run <clears throat> run around naked unconsciously, right? And then <laughs> the older ones would be like, "Oh, make them get dressed," you know, like make them get dressed. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's. I just say there's still an Eden. 
<laughs> still, <laughs> they're still, a, yeah. they're still in the garden. That makes sense. <laughs> and then making a draft, but uh, yeah. So uh, I wonder if the, I wonder if there's a kind of uh, you know the idea of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Have you heard this this idea that that uh, but that, that even like the, back then that re that re reappears even in like our childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, I mean, it's an evolutionary concept that we yeah. go through the phases Bet of uh, we go through the phases of of our evolutionary history and our em embryonic from our embryonic phase. We go from single cell through uh, reptilian and so forth. Right. This is the the idea anyway. And also in our brains, oh, yeah. our our brains have the lower brains, the stem, the and then slowly we get up to the mammalian brain and so forth. So yeah, but I was just I just was throwing this back to that. Like maybe we carry that kind of that innocence um which Child is why innocence, yeah yeah that, that there's something actually very mystical about a four-year-old um that's you'd never see that again and when, what there's a certain point at which awareness reaches a certain point and <laughs> and knowledge as well. is now possible and anger is possible in a way that it that's different and cruelty yeah. is now possible and but but for kids three and four and, and obviously younger it's a, there's a it's a very um it's a very interesting phase of their of their existence it'd be a, it'd be a blessed place to stay forever if you had forever had people to care for you <laughs> mm. and, no, and knowledge not... accrues with age as well and of course knowledge is what calls the fall leading from the forbidden tree of knowledge mm -hmm. exactly exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. interesting Uh, what? Sila in the, in the song. <laughs> that's, that's what you were talking about. <laughs> is it still unclear what Sila means? Like, I've heard that nobody knows exactly what that means. I think it's like musical notation. It's sort of like you know, you know. Yeah. Forte, forte, but it's just a, it's a it's an indication for the singer to take a to take a rest. Hmm. But in that is implied is implied contemplation. I think they have a Greek word in the Septuagint for that. Oh yeah, yeah. So they, I think they use the word uh, the apsalma. Hmm. And, and what does that, that mean? Means, like take a break, or like I guess it's like through the psalm or something. The eyes through, right? Um, oh, yeah. Like. Like in uh, dialysis or diarrhea. Um, <laughs> Diameter? Salma is just a, a psalm. Hmm. Oh, so just through psalm. Psalm hmm. it through, people. Psalm it through. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that confounds the word for me. I didn't, that no longer makes any sense based on that translation. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if Sam's coming back. He said he might join us again in an hour. That was a while ago. When he gets home? Maybe. Stuck on the freeway. Yeah, All right, probably. I'm going to have to uh, drop out, guys, because I'm getting tired. Well, thanks for joining, Mark. It was yeah, good no problem. hanging out with you. Yeah, fun yeah, yeah. Has, it, has everyone listened to Mark, my, interv or my interview with Mark on the Iron Cross? Oh, I hope He's yeah. good, guys. Listen to it. Good. Listen to it. Yeah, we did plug it. Got to plug it again. Plug it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we, plug we, did it we did. I remember uh, at the very end, I said people should check that out. They should, certainly. It was so a what, very real, good interview. Real quick question, Mark. What, what happened last time? Did your internet cut out? Because I remember you were talking and then you suddenly went silent and then you eventually just dropped out. Did, oh, you having, oh, I'm trying to remember problems? what happened. I didn't fall asleep. That I do know. Um, <laughs> I think... I think that might have been the night that my computer uh, decided to uh, basically the router, like the the stuff, the thing in the computer that connects wirelessly to the internet decided to break, so I had to do a like system a restore. Bluetooth or? Yeah, th that uh, for some reason it's to do with the Windows update and it just sometimes completely breaks and I've got to do like a Windows restore oh. because the drivers get messed up. So yeah, and then when I, I came back on by that time, I thought, you know, it's it's too late to 
just get back in. <laughs> yeah. So sorry about that. All right. Uh, yeah. At least I'm signing off this time. So we'll talk in the okay. new year. I'm sure. Yeah. Probably won't have any. I probably won't do any mother more till next year because we'll probably be celebrating Christmas and stuff. So good. Yeah. It's been a been a pleasure, guys. Yep. The yeah, whole year. One, Mark. So. Yeah. The yeah year. Definitely. To the next year. More successes to come. Best year ever. Best year ever. It's, it's I hope so. The current, the current year is officially over. <laughs> Not current so years. Oh, best best current year is officially ever. over. Yeah. Poor John Oliver. All right. Well, <laughs> you guys. I mean, it's 2016 and this is... It's 2016. Sure. Fuck 2016. <laughs> We're in president 2016. No! no! Trump won the election. Cubs won the World Series. What's next? Am I going to find a girlfriend? Okay. Uh, all right, okay. see you guys. <laughs> Have a good one. Get some rest. So, I like how literally your your, your your avatar drops out. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like it's it actually shows floor. the thing falling down and then the squares are realigning. Yeah, yeah. I guess I think if you're just watching on YouTube though, you can't really see that. Just like it just kind of disappears and. They don't have the animation to go with it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. so. Like, if you watch these on YouTube, you can see that. Yeah, they it's just kind of. They don't. So. Hey, uh, Lou, yeah, I was. Did did I ever bring up that uh, article by uh, John Derbyshire about the Chinese mailing list he was on? Did I ever talk about that? Have you ever read that before? Chinese mailing list. It's a, it's a really old article he wrote. Apparently, Derbyshire was talking about how he was on a... He had a Chinese friend who recommended that he join this mailing list because I guess he was working as a computer programmer and it was a bunch of Chinese uh, American computer programmers. And uh, Sounds familiar. Also the, mentioned it to me before. Yeah, I think... Yeah. I reread that article. It's always very interesting when I read it because he was basically saying that, um, like, the generation, I guess at that time it was like the Gen X sort of era of Chinese people were all kind of, like, fiercely nationalistic to the point of, like, just blaming everything, blaming all the Chinese problems on the world. <laughs> it was just kind of funny how they say, like, sometimes I just think about China and cry. China never did a single thing wrong yet, yet we've suffered so much. <laughs> like that it's a very interesting piece China did do nothing wrong it's all you, you opium war people I'm sorry what's that Lee? But China didn't do nothing it's all you opium <laughs> war people yeah he's actually appropriating us well the opium wars in fairness were pretty were pretty much was, that's legitimate to be upset about, but I mean, but we didn't bring the opium, did we? Well, I think uh, we didn't bring the opium. Of course, did. we didn't it was bring you in the opium. east. Where'd the opium come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, my I thought what was happening in the opium wars was that, like, well, there was an article on Amron recently about Chinese, about the Chinese, and it said that, like, what happened was that the opium dealers found that they, the they had a good market in China, and then the Chinese government saw these like, like opium heads basically becoming like it was just basically like hurting their people. So they said, "Okay, we're not going to allow opium to be sold here anymore." But the Western British, I guess, uh, opium dealers were like, "Hey, but we want to. This is our market here. We want to sell this. And we want our money." So they went to war over it, just like to, be, to force China to to accept the opium that they were dealing in. I guess that's basically what it was all about, if I, I understood correctly. Hey, Chops. Hey, from, hey, oh. hey. Wait, wait, wait. I, uh, was that American guy in the Opium Wars that you were talking about earlier? Uh, I don't remember his name, but it was an article on Amron talking about him. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, guys, we can sell some drugs to these Chinese. <laughs> It's like, my bad. <laughs> it's funny because all the while, in Muff, Muff the captured popular market. British imagination, it's like, <laughs> here's a Chinaman. He brings drugs, opium, and stuff. Like, 
Okay, come on, guys. You're the ones who sell this vile stuff to the Chinese, and meanwhile, back home, you're like, "Watch out for those Chinamen. They bring drugs. They're not <laughs> saying the best. They are rapists." Well, you have Mr. Wu, the uh, the laundry man in in uh, uh, which part of London was it? Limehouse, I think that's where the Chinese were in Britain. You know that song by George Formby about Mr. Wu? I don't even know where that is. No, I don't know the song. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's George Formby was this uh, English singer. I think he's from Lancashire. Back in the, he's popular back in the old days. And uh, he had this character, Mr. Wu, who's a Chinese man that <laughs> that lived in England. And it was very stereotypical, of course, but it was funny. And like during World War II, there's a song about how Mr. Wu is now an air raid warden. And, he says, so if you got a chink in your window, hey, now you got one at your door. <laughs> yeah. Not very PC, but it's an amusing artifact. Let me see if I can find some George for me. Oh, Mr. Wu. George, George Formby. Got Chinese oh. laundry. Yeah, Mr. Wu. Well, he had a song. Uh, he had a song called When I'm Cleaning Windows. That's like his most famous song. And it's basically this song full of double entendres about the stuff he sees when he looks in windows. Yeah. That's fine before okay i wasn't sure because i can't really tell how it sounds from the other end there's a way of playing I, stuff on from your if you're the if you're the hangout master really you can get apps you can get apps over on the side there i've not done it myself but um yeah i was just holding it up with the speakers basically we're down to three viewers i guess talking about george for me and Politically incorrect songs about Chinese people are <laughs> drive away the viewers. Goy, you haven't been you haven't been reading your uh, demographic reports, the, <laughs> the the polls, the what is the what do they call that <laughs> surveys? Anyway, the kids don't the kids don't go for the uh, for the, the racist Chinese uh, shtick anymore. <laughs> Doesn't sell. Well, I know Derb said that, like, I remember he said that the Orientals were seen as just being dishonest people. That was, like, the stereotype they grew up with back then. They were seen as, like, sort of shady people, I guess. How they, like, well, you talk about all the different stereotypes they have about different nationalities. Uh, so, I'm sorry, what? It's, well, it, it, it's... It's true. Our Orientals are uh, more likely to be dishonest with uh, people who are not part of their part of their in group. If, so, if you're not Chinese or if you're not Korean or something, you, you you may. That's how they make a dollar out of fifteen cents. You'll you'll pay dollar. <laughs> 50 cents all of money. money. You take 50 cents here, you take 50 cents there, then you have one dollar. Is that from that then Russell Peters stand up? store and buy something else. <laughs> I got the classic the other day. I got the classic special just for you. You know, when I was getting just a normal service of some kind. <laughs> Can't remember where I was, but oh yeah, just for you. No one else. Just, just for, for you. you. <laughs> one dollar just for you. 
But really, I felt kind of special, even though I knew it was deception. I no, no. I so, so, so when they say things like that, you had to play along, and you have to kind of—I don't know the game, do I? Yeah, so. Subtly. So, so you, you you say things like, "Well, you know, um, I'm if, if this." Uh, if this goes well, I'm going to recommend this to my friends and stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah, give me another ten percent. Getting it's because Lu Yi, Lu Yi brings down the empire with the, giving the M, giving the inside baseball baseball to the to the Aryans. Now I know what to do. Oh, actually, what it was, I was buying something with a with an ATM card at a store, and there was a six, there was whatever a six dollar minimum. And, and I was going to get, I just needed two bucks back for parking. So I had to find something for $4 and I found something for three ninety nine. dollars She said, and I said, can I, oh, will three ninety nine work? Yes. Just for you. <laughs> it's just a figure of speech, I suppose. It's just, but it, it was a classic sort of. It's just you Northern Europeans. You need to haggle more. And it was right in Chinatown too. So, you know, it was real. It was well, if, if you're in Chinatown, then you really should haggle. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, Vancouver basically Chinatown now. You got to give a you got to give a um, give some YouTube seminars on this uh, on these skills. You, 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 I'm not you, even good at it, but I, I'm just telling you, you have to try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Louis, what you were saying earlier about like you go somewhere else, you say fifty cents, you have one dollar. Was that from Russell Peters? Russell Peters, yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard that bit. Wow, that that I, sketch was more than. Yeah, that was many years ago, <laughs> more than a decade. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing that though. I was in high school. Uh, I was already graduated from college a decade ago. I won't tell you how old I am. I'm an old fart. We already know. You've told us before. No. Oh. Okay. Well, I am officially <laughs> not in my mid twenties, so. Oh, really? You just turned 26? Or 27? Do you call 27 out of the mids? The mids are, what, 4 to 6? I'll leave you to guess my exact age, but uh, I'll, say I'll just 20s. say I'm not in my mid-20s anymore. I'll say 27. Well, you know Lightning Patriots in high school? Yeah. So. Really? Yeah. yeah, we were talking about it earlier. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. He's just a kid. Just a punk. Yeah. So young. <laughs> a, a little baby Christ. Yeah. A little That's baby serious. Christ cock. He <laughs> 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 uh, uh, was talking about I was high school at a prayer uh, service where they were talking about mud diversity and mud globalism all the time. So, uh, oh. Yeah, we actually, like, what Red told me is that we have, like, a day every year where we, like, celebrate our diversity and they usually have like uh like usually a black priest come like it seems to be very explicit hmm. is he actually is he a catholic priest yeah he's a catholic priest oh, you go to a catholic the speech is like like when they brought up uh i think they brought up like the uh the southern poverty like i think there was another sort of tim wise type speaker who was like talking about oh there's just all these hate groups in the southern poverty law center and then what really red told me was my uh, uh teacher said you know the school used to be like 96 percent white but we've enacted all of these programs to increase the diversity and it's it, it, like with, and we intend to like expand and re reduce the white uh, attendance. <laughs> they actually said it like that. Wow. Yeah, they like literally said that. Like we're going oh. to get rid, of, get rid of the whites. Wow, ethnic cleansing at your Catholic school. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what yeah. genocide! I, I really, I really wonder oh, if, if like sort of the Jared Taylor sort of uh, you're gonna have your gangs in the school. <laughs> <laughs> hey Sam, you made it back. It's gonna be like, like what really put me on the edge was like there were like quite a few. Uh, there was actually this like one black student who like 
was in our school for like two years on the second year she like got a lot of trouble like i saw her in a lot in those rumors that she was carrying drugs and this is a pretty pretty safe area so it's like really big thing Mm -hmm. to be kind of out in the open it was just a rumor though or do you know it was like a rumor but it seems like she got into something very serious and she would always spout about like black lives matter and i think she did speak about like a crime once like where she got into like a lot of trouble with a cop like this cop is racist how was she how was she that how was she at the school it sounds like a private school yeah it is a private school is she there on a scholarship or like, she parents, was really weird like, uh Like those, like was, you, you, you knew there was something really shady with this uh, person. She was signaling ghetto like, but, hard at the Catholic school. Yeah. Yep. So you're saying she was a uh, like her parents actually sent her there, like they yeah put their own money or like and I think the major thing is that they probably have like a sort of like oh I want to go to like the uh, the higher school and we'll do this to give these black folks a chance and that's kind of like a kind of strong they, pull thing they have scholarships you think is that why yeah i think it's like a scholarship thing or something like that yeah yeah like oh, they have a lot under. of chinese foreign exchange like a voucher students. yeah See, it's supposed to be like a college prep thing or whatever so they have a lot of they also have a lot of foreign students, mostly Chinese. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, are, are, are they the currently going to like? From... So you said this is a Catholic school. Are you currently going to a Catholic school? Yeah, I've always, uh, I've pretty much been going to a Catholic school for probably half of my life so far. Yeah, how's it? I used to go like, to public uh, school. Yeah. I heard that like it's uh, gotten pretty liberal. It's not like uh, it is. Uh, th- there is they they still hold up the abortion thing. Some whispers about the whole marriage issue, mm-hmm. but th- and also they're they're pretty con- socially conservative. But they will always kind of play the cuck card. The what card? And the cuck card. Cuck. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, they they have a lot of sort of the milk and toast but sort of tolerance. thing with tolerance. Yeah, <laughs> like sounds like millennial degeneracy. Yeah, like just kind of not degeneracy in the AIDS stuff, but I'm just talking like just kind of the soft, yeah, softy Christianity yeah. milk and toast. Is yeah. it like uh, comparable to a lot of what you see in Protestantism, like the? It's. I would say it's comparable, but they're very, but like, for example, if a student makes something like goes off on something, like the teacher will say, no, the church condemns this. Yeah. Like what sort of thing? Nope. Like, for example, like, uh, like, the, the, like, I don't know, this is just because I have religion classes, obviously. However, I think there is sort of, uh, there is at least an atmosphere saying, like, well, like, oh, why don't they have, like, usually they'll, a lot of my theology teachers are pretty good. Or they're kind of within either, they're within that sort of millennial degenerate, or they're, like, I have one really base teacher who I think is pretty much within the reactor sphere, or at least within thought. Yeah. Does he go to a traditional Latin mass? I wish I could. <laughs> My parents are very, very, like, laid back. Uh, Like, they hold me back from going to confession sometimes. Oh, Uh, really? Yeah, they're, like, they're worried about it. Like, (sighs) I want you engaging in that. Like, why why is he he wearing a cross? Why is he going to mass? (laughs) What if they don't have this scapular? They're not Catholics, then. They, they they call themselves Catholics, but they're very uh, they're, they're they're not practiced. It's like I, I I call myself Catholic. I believe in Jesus, but you know I, I'm not gonna like make it very explicit. It's 
kind of how suburbia kind of conditions you into that kind of feeling. Conformism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of becoming very secular and materialistic. Yeah. Well, I hate I to really, leave so soon. Last. I hate. Sorry, I don't want to yeah, catch up. I hate suburbia. Right. Let you let yeah, you guys. Everything you have to go. Wait. I'm just gonna sign out. Yeah, I've got to clean up the house. I got to clean the kitchen. Blah blah blah. So I got for your going meeting. From the, yeah. The, good luck. The good boys. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining, William. So it's good to have you. We had some good discussion. Yeah. Sorry to you know. Sorry to bring up controversy. You know. <laughs> uh, what controversy did he bring up? Oh no. no. <laughs> Uh, it was the just, uh, Aryan controversy, and I won't tell you which one. Controversy. <laughs> uh, I'm familiar with the Aryan controversy. Are you talking about Arius, um, how he was condemned? Uh, yeah, no. No, I, uh, no. 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 You're talking about Aryan, like racially Aryan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the beauty oh, of it. Right. You can't tell which Aryan. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, my... the true Aryans are really the Iranians and Northern Indians. Well, I'm a true <laughs> Aryan Kang, so you're an honorary. <laughs> and I made you. I made no, no, you in no. a laboratory. I, I am. I am three percent Aryan. Okay, that makes yeah. me an Aryan Kang. <laughs> <laughs> we was we was song, song we was the we was to carrions. <laughs> is it Kang? Is that where the Kang surname came from? No, no, no. That's uh, Korean. <laughs> it's the uh, it's oh Kang's Korean. It's not Chinese. The, the, yeah. the we was Kang's. Well, meme. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. I was joking when I said that. I'm familiar yeah. with that meme. Anyway, In have a good night, William. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Right. See you. Right. Down to four again. Down to four. Lightning, Peter, is there some noise on your microphone? Oh, yeah. I was like just kind of walking around. around. Yeah. Oh, okay. No one's commented on my metallic voice. <laughs> It's not really, it's not really like the robot voice that you had before, but like. It's Are you of... talking over the desktop? It's never predictable. I just, I don't know. I sometimes have it on a desk and sometimes on a lap, and it doesn't seem to just neatly correspond to either. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, oh well. Yep. Ah. My elbow cracked. I'm always, I've always done all these from the same spot in my room. I'm always lying on the floor when I do these. At the time when you had a different mic. Well, that was a, actually it was a different computer I was using, but it was still in the same place. Oh, it's still the same place. Mm. Yeah. I, I like have... sit down. And like the reason I made all that noise is sometimes I walk around. I talk mm. every once in a while. Just to get the blood flowing. Right. Yeah, I'm not same. on a mobile device. I'm on a... On every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is my first time doing it on a mobile device. It's like so much like I feel so free. Are you so on it right now, Sam? Yeah. Okay, you sound different than you did before. Yeah. You sound more clear now. Yeah, because, like, I, I was always talking from my Mac. That's why my voice was pretty choppy. Well, I meant, like, when you when you were here earlier and you had to leave. Like, yeah. You... Okay. okay, yeah. So, I was, uh, I, Sam, I've, uh, I still haven't figured out how to edit that, uh, that, um, hangout, but I, uh, I just have it 
as private for now, just so I can figure until I figure out how to edit it. Okay. Yeah, and I'm sure there must be a way. Yeah. Oh, actually, a good one. I remember that one was was uh, it was you, me, Louis, Henry, and Mark. That was actually a pretty good one. Nice yep. Good, good um, question. Yeah. Are we still live on there? Uh, yeah, we are. Yeah, okay. Anything you want to bring up or? Um, can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, just uh, you guys. Well, you you're familiar, like you visit Faith and Heritage, right? Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. Well, like I know that they're really big fans of uh, Bojidar Marinov over there. Uh, well, I think they said that he's kind of. I think they've had some critical words for him too. Yeah, I mean, I like meant I, that sarcastically. You know, it wasn't. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> it wasn't too long ago that like I've had my runs run-ins with him. Um, you know, he's he's a real piece of work. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's like very super pro immigration, yet like he believes like we should have like the Old Testament law, like stoning people and stuff. It's uh, <laughs> it's a weird combination. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if he holds the stoning part anymore, except for maybe marijuana, like the libertarian type of stoning. <laughs> Sounds very traditionalist. No, he's not very traditionalist <laughs> at all. Yeah, I was, I was being sarcastic. But... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really sad to see how a lot of the uh, vanguards of conservatism or traditionalism kind of get paused or they kind of sell out. Yeah, I mean, um, like, if yeah. you, especially, like, true like within all like the protestant conservative movements like uh like you compare rush Sunni with uh his followers afterwards who took over his movement it's like not even the same thing yeah i hear that rush Sunni's son has tried to sort of disavow some of the things he said or said that well he wasn't really saying that's what they were saying on Good Morning White America, I think it was, the other day. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think Russ Sunni was like a genetic, a eugenicist like type uh, Nazi, but he comes from a world where, you know, it's kind of like if you're dating somebody of a different race or culture and marrying them, you don't do it like uh, you. You don't do it lightly. If that makes sense, you know, because Armenians are like very. Um, they really care about passing on their race. Uh, you know, the survival of their race for understandable reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, he was kind of uh, saying that within a context which. Uh, could lead to some controversy, especially um, afterwards when people look back from the modern era onto what he said. You know, and it's also like when it's about racism, it's kind of like you have to define racism. It's when people talk about racism, I don't even know what they're talking about anymore. Are they yeah. talking about? Like a, like you want to wipe out everybody except your own race, or are you talking about just simply having preference for your own race? Right. If that's what you mean, if you mean the latter, then, well, everybody's racist by that definition. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, I don't, like, I hear this word racism is sort of like this kind of magical thing where they say, like, but is this racist or is that racist? It's like, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a vague term. It's like you're debating really what a word means rather than 
the actual content of the argument or something. Yeah. It just drives me crazy when people frame it in terms of in those terms because it's like, what do you even mean by that? Yeah. Well, have you noticed when you're arguing with a liberal, they like to say, ask you, what do you mean by that? But when you turn it back around on them, they don't like it. <laughs> it's like, uh, I was talking about this with my friend Greg all the time. It's like the w- words they don't like is are very unclear, but the words that they do like are very clear. Like they want, they argue assuming that you signed on to the same definition as they did of certain words. Yeah. It's like pretty much 90% of the argument is the dialectic. You know, it's like you have to claim back the definitions of words. And once you've done that, you've pretty much won the argument. Or at least stalemated it. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's part of the problem why we have trouble seeing eye to eye. A lot of times we don't even necessarily agree on what we're even talking about as far as what words we're using. Yeah. That's yeah. true. It's frustrating. Mm-hmm. What made you think of uh, Bojadar Marinov? Is that the name? I, I think uh, besides like his actual stance on issues, you could do whatever you want with it, but it's his own like him as a person, he's like, if you run into a disagreement with him, like if you disagree with him, like he accuses you of being a idolater, pagan or, um, or non-believer or whatever, a heretic, (laughs) like he pretty much says you're lost if you don't agree with him. Wow. And it, we weren't yeah. even discussing the, like, immigration issue. It, this was under my own, like, Normie Facebook account. It was about, like, the police issue. It's like, oh, like, you know, because they don't really, they really don't like the cops. They pretty much uh, agree with the Black Lives Matter movement on the police. Yeah. And they think that, like, oh, like, we shouldn't have any cops whatsoever. Yet, at the same time, they also believe in this uh, lesser magistrates thing where, like, the local and state governments resist the federal government. Yet, somehow, they're Mm -hmm. supposed to do that without having police. Do they think some militia is going to do it or something? I think it's sort of like they lean strongly towards (laughs) anarcho-capitalism. So, yeah, they pretty much uh, believe that it should be, like, a volunteer nonprofit militia that does it. (laughs) I don't know what to make of that. It's just... Yeah, it's the Christian Reconstructionist movement. Like, I used to consider myself part of that, but, like, they're the new vanguard that took over the movement, they're like nothing. Like they took it in a completely different direction than I believe what Rush Dooney wanted to go in. Although Rush Dooney is a little weird in some areas too. I mean, it's sort of like, it's what you get with brilliant thinkers. Like, yeah, they tend to think in very, mavericky ways which is interesting but you have to take it with a grain of salt Mm -hmm. yeah it's funny how a lot of the most brilliant people are also have a slight crazy streak 
in some ways, it seems. I'm not necessarily yeah. saying Rush Juni's crazy, but like you do see that their minds are are not typical in many ways. Yeah. And also like if you're naturally your followers are going to take your ideas farther than you will. Or some will if you're not willing to do it yourself. True. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, McDermott and Marinoff definitely took Rush Juni's ideas farther than he did, especially in regard to like the small government thing, the anarcho-capitalism. Although I'm not sure because I, I haven't fully read all of Rush Juni's works. He kind of wrote a lot of stuff. I still don't know how anyone reads the the Mosaic Law and thinks, oh look, here is a pattern of anarcho-capitalism. Well, the way they make that argument is like they assume that um, for example, like if the Mosaic Law says nothing about um, speed limits, then we shouldn't have speed limits. It's kind of like they make an argument from silence. Like they so have it's like, a continue. Yeah, that's really begging uh, the question. Saying, are, so it's like they're saying basically the only law is the Mosaic Law, and everything else is just kind of a free for all. No law at all. Yeah. So, but, but they do follow the Mosaic Law, though. Um. Are you talking like about like? Are you talking about like not eating pork, circumcision, stuff like that? No, they're well, not uh, Judaizers. Okay, well, but they do. Um, but they believe in Old I Testament mean, things like stoning, or um, some of them do, like uh, Rush Stuni did. But I think. Uh, so most of his followers kind of walked away from that. Like McDermott definitely walked away, sort of like put that aside, like because it's embarrassing, I guess, you know. Yeah, I mean, I can see how that wouldn't play very well to most people. Yeah, it went. Sorry, my hand is hurting for some reason. I was just kind of having to shift a minute there. But... Yeah. Speaking but of anarcho-capitalism, I was going to say that John Locke sounded a, was was literally the first anarcho-capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did he not? Did he say that taxation is theft? <laughs> Well, I think some of his arguments definitely set that kind of anarcho-capitalistic uh, precedent that, like, all people are inherently good. We're all inherited with rights. You know, I I'm not going to kill you. You don't kill me. <laughs> yeah, the NAP, pretty much. NAP. Well, the Presbyterians <laughs> have a very different view of human nature, and yet they, well, apparently these Christian Reconstructionists still do have... Uh, an anarcho-capitalistic view of. Oh, I f think Calvinism <laughs> lends towards like free market and anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism. Yeah, the 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 Dutch, the Dutch. Yeah, definitely <laughs> the Dutch. Dutch. But, <laughs> but like the Puritans, when they came over here, they they were all Calvinists, and they also held to like the whole. Um, American pull yourself up by your bootstrap thing. Yep. Yeah. You're a Calvinist, right, Sam? Um, yeah. Okay. I'm technically a Calvinist. <laughs> technically? <laughs> the eternal Anglo. Yeah. <laughs> the eternal what? <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, yep. The Dutch, it's... the Anglo. <laughs> I think it's. I think I'm more of like a nuanced uh, Calvinist, if that makes sense. A nuanced Calvinist. Yeah. Okay. Like everything. Very nuanced. Yeah. Well, well, like, you mean he's even... very nuanced in his Calvinism. Well, how, like, what are some of the nuances of it? Like, you um, disagree with some parts of standard Calvinism, or? Yeah, um, there are some parts I disagree with. Um, it's hard to point out or else like, uh, in other words, there are some parts of the trajectory of historic Calvinist thinking that I disagree with. Like, for example, how um, Calvinists uh, are very anti-art, like especially the Puritans. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's like very. Well, I know, like the Puritans, they like banned a lot of stuff because they thought it was, it was like, too impure for them or something. Yeah. Sam, you just need to be the right kind of reformed guy. You just have to be Anglican. <laughs> or um, would Federal Vision be okay too? There's such a Are range they... in Federal Vision. I, I don't think there's a single program in Federal Vision, but. Sure, if that floats your boat. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I I happen to think a lot of um, a lot of federal vision on the uh, kind of light heart James B. Jordan wing uh, kind of veers off into weird stuff. It kind of becomes a neo Anabaptist ecclesiology because of the strict divide that they have between the church and society at large. Um, Whereas in Anglicanism, well, at least in traditional Anglicanism, uh, those two are tied much closely together. Um, as as we see on the continent as well, um, especially in Zurich with uh, Bullinger. Yeah. Traditional Anglicanism, like John Henry Newman, no. <laughs> I am so triggered. No, wait. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. Getting the Oxford movement broke. <laughs> Even had dumb ideas. I don't think even papists should follow them. Uh, Papist. Literally a church that was created... Because because of my, my, my marriage and <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <such a meme. laughs> created over like just some just because I wanted like just because I couldn't get my annulment. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, your church was created just because you wanted some uh, some indulgences. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that that's why that's why the Protestants. The Lutherans were formed just because they like they were like, oh, these indulgences. That means like all everything, all tradition is evil. <laughs> well, uh, that's obviously a bit of a well. Indulgences, is honestly, like I don't think that they were like the thing that formed the church. We, the church has had many things that it's adapted and dropped over time. Well, the church. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church still does indulgences. You still get indulgences, for example, for uh. Uh, going up the, um, well, I mean, lots of things, right? You you get you get indulgences for doing certain novenas at certain times, um, or making pilgrimages uh, at certain times in certain places and stuff like that. Hmm. So that system. Well, yeah, there is that. There is that. You say not that money. There is certain. Things that you pray for and wish from God, like you know. Right, and, and the official teaching is that that is going to correspond to uh, some amount of purgatory, because mm -hmm. sins are and 
in purgatory. Yeah. It's from what I've heard. I haven't gotten too much into indulgences. I just kind of know basically what the history textbooks have said and maybe a little bit of some some stuff I listen to. I think Anglo textbooks tend to talk less about this stuff because they're Anglo. <laughs> yes, and then what do you uh <laughs> And what are your indulgences for? <laughs> like you go defaulting towards Anglican. your your, uh, your your eternal Anglo your eternal Anglo capitalism. <laughs> what? Because like you know, England was like you know the the mercantile empire. <laughs> I, uh, well, I'm not even a capitalist. I'm probably the most socialist guy in these hangouts at any given time. So How like, socialist like, are you? <laughs> well, like, an like, I customarily get mistaken uh, on Twitter and elsewhere for a commie, and then I have to say, no, I'm not. Not a communist, but I am a socialist. But I'm not like Bernie Sanders because he's so bourgeois. So what kind you're of like, socialist like... are you exactly? What? Like, I'm asking Lu Yi. Like, to what extent are you a socialist? I, I think um... I'm a, a national syndicalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, concretely, that's. Um... Concretely, I think in many areas it looks about the same as distributism. Um, of course, you know, my more Marxist-Leninist friends will uh, criticize that for being a bit too close to bourgeois economy and stuff, and they want to abolish all private property. Private okay, property. The thing is, though, yeah. No one actually wants to abolish. All, well, okay, so people make the distinction between personal property and private property because guess what? If you're going to have shared property, no one is seriously going to suggest sharing underwear. <laughs> so all of this is on a continuum, and you're you're basically well. The the distinction people make generally between. Um, private property and personal property is that private property is um, stuff that is um, productive property. So stuff that is stuff that can be considered to be capital. So that includes land, which you know, so, some people may actually not want um, non-collective ownership of land. Um, so um, yeah, socialists will differ on that, but. Uh, but I think especially things like um, machinery, which not everyone, I mean, if there's some big expensive machine that, I don't know, does nuke stuff, for example, um, you know, that that's not going to be owned by, or if it's owned by one person, he's going to be hella rich. So, so the idea, I think, is to, um, to cooperativize the ownership of that machinery and stuff like that so that everyone has a say in what to actually do with it so that it's not just big honcho who has this big honking thing um <laughs> who then makes everyone into wedge slaves by telling everyone okay so i have this thing you don't i have all the leverage and i can hire anyone else so um take work for this much <laughs> So the idea is to, to, to avoid having something like that and instead, um, you know, stuff like, um, so, you know, if, I think in any society you're going to have small family businesses and stuff unless uh, that the family itself is going to pass away when the bourgeois relations of property uh, have, have passed away and stuff like that, uh, which... Well, to be fair, that's not even entirely new with Marx. That's something you kind of see in Plato's Republic already. It, it's just an eccentricity. Um, so I'm not into that 
you know, as a Christian, I think family is ordained by God and family has property and stuff like that. Uh, but, right. you know, on, on a larger scale, if, if you have banks and things, well, who, who's going to own that stuff? You could give it to external stockholders or you could make this a credit union. Yeah, I think... You know, low-interest loans to the community and invest in the community and stuff like that. So a lot of this is actually not edgy. It's just uh, it's just stuff that you know, is, is still on the side of socialism, and it's certainly not capitalistic. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, it's... it's... We should nationalize banking. That's for sure. Like the only no, we should the, nationalize banks. Abolish banking to some extent. Natural resources. Well, so if you have oh, just ban usury, ban usury, usury, of course, ban usury. Yeah, it's banned in the Bible. Yeah. It's banned in the Mosaic right. Law. It's right so there. So if we can ban usury, but find ways of banking that don't involve usury, whereby people can. Especially for new industries and things like that, um, new industries to develop well will always need investments. So uh, one of the ways of making the virtual money for these things is to just is for the state to say, okay, um, here is a loan of this much. And yeah, that's fiat money. And some people are going to be like, oh, it's not the gold standard. It's fiat money. This is evil. But uh I think it's um, it's worked before. Um, in Taiwan, for example, did, so when the Nationalist Party Taiwan back from Japan, uh, about ninety percent of the island, ninety percent of the land on the island was owned by twenty families. Wow! Wow! Uh, so everyone else was basically a tenant farmer. Um, on the land of these 20 families who really didn't have to do any work because they would just take rents and the level of development was very low because no one was motivated. So, so it was kind of, was it like yeah, feudalism almost or? Kind of. Um, and no one was motivated to actually develop this land any further because, you know, if you're a surf basically, <laughs> you're not responsible for this stuff, so you're just like, okay, I'll I'll do whatever work I need to do, but uh, I I just have to eat. That's all. And if you're a landowner, you're just like, well, um, I'm one of many families, so I'm rich anyway. I don't have to work, so where's the problem? So, what the nationalist government did when it first um when it got Taiwan and uh, retreated to Taiwan and stuff, well, forced these 20 families to, um, or to sell off their land to their tenants. And in exchange, what they got was not money per se. They got shares in is that did not yet exist in Taiwan. So they got investment shares in these industries. So that ended up being a win-win-win. It's a win for the farmers because they're now responsible for their own land and they actually improve it. Um, it's a win for these new investors in these new light industries because they actually take off and succeed. And, well, since both of these ventures are successful, it's a win for the state as well. So that's the example I give when people say fiat money, it doesn't work, it's evil, it's uh, it's fake money, you're just cheating people. Well, sometimes when you do things like this, it actually works. And everyone benefits from it. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, I think... I mean, yeah, I think... Oh, echo. Oh, echo. Uh... Okay, I was just saying, like, I think definitely there, you have to look at the big picture and what benefits the most people or the benefits the society as a whole. Not just like, I mean, I guess words like socialism have a negative connotation because, I mean, it does, 
you know, socialism in many ways can disincentivize productivity. And, but I mean, if you have like a, a larger goal in mind, like the health, having a healthy society where people are invested in it at all levels, I mean, that's, that's another issue. Yeah. And I don't, I don't always call myself a socialist because I know some people are just going to be uh, Lou, you sounds like you're kind of breaking up. This is a problem on my end. People are a little and say, so, um, I'm a monarchist, uh, socialist, and not like Bernie socialist because he's like too unedgy and stuff. <laughs> he's just controlled opposition. Uh, you want real socialism, dear? I just call myself a, a slightly collectivist or collectivist in certain terms. <coughs> So if someone is being malicious with sort of being exploitive, sort of going bourgeois, then I think the state would need to, well, definitely the state would need to take certain actions to combat so we don't get into sort of the situation we're in right now where the state bows to, you know, the, the merchants. Hey, is it? Are you guys, does it sound like the audio is breaking up or is it just on my end? I'm not sure. You're hearing it too, Louie? Or... How does it sound for you, Sam? Yeah, I could sound like, it sounds stacky. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like people are breaking up at various points. I wasn't sure if it was just my internet connection or if it was is it, the system as did well. I, did I sound staticky? Uh, well, I don't know. Just when you were talking earlier, it sounded well, like it was breaking up. Mm. Like, there'd be like, the audio would stop for a second and then it would continue where it left off. Mm. So I don't know what to make of that. We've been going for almost three hours. Do you guys want to keep talking or... I mean, does anyone else have an idea? I mean, I'm not trying to shut it down if people still want to talk. It's just that I'm, we've been going over. Shut it down, boy. <laughs> no, no, not like that. <laughs> Do they still have that drop on TRS? I haven't heard them go, shut it down. They haven't used that in a long time on The Daily Show. But they should still. really do it because, I mean, this is, a, this is a bit of a philosophy I have right now is to use every sort of concession they use that that's given to us. So for example, the Trump presidency, we have a lot of ground. To, uh, we have a lot, a lot more opportunity than we would have with the Hillary presidency. If you go, I'm saying more time. Yeah. We got to strike while the iron is hot. <laughs> yeah. The iron is hot and we have, we yeah, have I mean, a lot of, and we could just keep pushing until, you know, it does it stops. You yeah. Start pushing for immigration regulation so we don't have as much problems in the future. Well, sure. Yeah, that's what I'm just kind of saying is that we can just keep pushing until you push on one hand to make the 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 bourgeois to kind of bend to you, and, and on the other hand, we can the sort of their ability to combat the people. Hmm. by keep sort of combating them. I don't even like the term bourgeois. This sounds so Marxist to me whenever <laughs> I hear people talk I, that I honestly like the word bourgeois because it implies that, like, you know, sort of the lavishness and lack of... Uh, I think the lack of any sort of tradition or hardship that the... But the nobility compared to like medieval nobility, it's like very degenerated. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think of like champagne socialists or limousine liberals, yeah, those champagne kind of things. Socialists, people, it, it, it kind of reflects kind of the suburban mindset where you just kind of have this degeneration of values 
because it's like everything's carefree. I don't have, I'm so secure. Yeah. You know, when you think security, it's like, you know, uh, you can, you can do whatever you want and nobody will know. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, it, it, it's, it's like this sort of, it's like easy space for the devil to work in. If you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what, and then that's kind of mindset with the bourgeois. It's kind of yeah. that, and you can have that happen to the people usually when <clears throat> wealth isn't given up to some higher purpose. It's usually kind of um, it's know, used for self indulgence. Materialistic people kind of become idols. Uh, <laughs> ironically, ironically, they become I think, they, uh, an idolatry of materialism opposed to like giving it to or they become higher. the idol rich. <laughs> yeah, opposed to like desecrating it to like churches or something. But I, I mean, you know, you can have your uh, box box and call the church. <laughs> Do you have something um, to say, Sam? Or yeah, I was just re remarking that um, common filth always says that what happens in private always comes out into the public. Hmm. I think it's said in Revelation that. It's what's said on uh, in the uh, something will be said on the rooftops. I think that that's in the Gospels, or that could be in the Gospels. Yeah. yeah, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus talks about that how the secrets will be shouted out from the rooftops. Mm. Uh, when you're talking about common Phil says that. What happens in private always comes out to the public. Like, what did, what do they mean by that? Like, in what context uh, is it's he? It's usually speaking in of? the context of homosexuality. How, like, um, because people in our circles will always say, like, we don't care if people like are gay in private. You know, as long as they keep it to themselves. Yeah. You know, but his argument is pretty much that, like, uh, what you allow to happen within the private will eventually, like. Seep into it's the public. Gonna, yeah, it will seep into public. It will like get worse and worse. Kind of like uh you know, like your, your adultery. Like it could be a private matter, but eventually it's gonna affect your entire you're gonna, family. You're, you're basically gonna have your uh your standard fun mm -hmm. parties on the streets. <laughs> so, oh what a yeah. funny what a funny comparison. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, I think it's you know. like right now it's ninety nine percent the way there. Yeah, well, it, it basically is with the pride parades. They're basically standard fuck parties on on parade on a float. Yeah, well, <laughs> right now it's uh, show max. Um, excuse yeah. me, Showtime or Cinemax. Um, tomorrow it's gonna be like uh, you know. Like, um, two, one of those tube channels or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Like if you look on YouTube, they're like pushing this kind of shit. They've been pushing that stuff for like years, and in yeah. the media, and eventually, because there is signaling in the media that it's something that's quite apparent. Yeah, and that's why you have like, oh, I'm born this way, and like, because they think so far back, but actually they were signaled into it. Yeah. Yeah, you're it's absolutely right. It's all about signaling. Right. signaling. You all know that pornography, I mean, excuse me, pedophilia is next. Yeah. yeah. And uh, It's pedophilia, and, and then they'll start bestiality. They'll legalize pornography on almost any software, assuming that the, the state doesn't collapse, which I think we're, we're, we're talking, I, I don't, I think it's always the saying that, like, you know, it can't get worse than this, but I think those are kind of ideals and endpoints of liberalism, but eventually there could be a collapse before that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which, speaking of which, is like, uh, for conservatives, their winning issues are social issues, and they're the winning issues for liberals, too. And liberals are going after the social issues while conservatives just want to leave it alone. Oh, we just want to like create jobs and stuff. Yeah. We want to live like 
the eighties or the fifties all over again. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be nineteen eighty all over again, folks. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, right. And and then it's just so funny because like they, they they don't even go back to stuff like you know, like reenacting the uh, the and the anti buggery laws. Like oh, that's just yeah. complete. That 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 isn't even spoken <laughs> and, in you know even even the, in alt right circles. That's kind of like looked down upon. Yeah, and also like uh, the Christian Reconstruction movement. Like uh, one of their one of the things that they could have used to um, really push that movement forward and popularize it was that the whole um, like death penalty for uh, homosexuality but like they quickly abandoned that because it's controversial so it quickly became like it's a controversial it's like the, one of the first reforms that were made was like to reform it to only like life sentences and then it just kept going down yeah and regressing until it's you know fuckery in the streets yeah yeah It always seems, and this is just kind of where you have Kali Yuga, it just keeps intensifying and you find that yeah. it'll intensify unless if you combat it directly. Yeah, well, I mean, the problem is that people, like the church is way too comfortable right now. That's the main problem, right? And um, it would need... You would need to have like a real disaster to like really wake up the church. Yeah, and that's always something that I've I've always kind of had in my head the idea of like, okay, if the church gets, if the church truly is, which I still I I think it's gonna be more of like it's gonna get to this point, and then you're gonna have kind of the more reactionary wing take over. And then the church might schism or something like that. However, if the church does get into, like, if if I were to make a second choice, I'd probably go to Greek Orthodoxy as a backup. Well, I mean, as far as the churches go, I mean, like, do you think there's something going on in the seminaries? Because I've heard the seminaries have gotten pretty left wing. Uh, I, I would assume, like I, remember, I mean, if that, like I, which I think seminaries are we are, talking about? Are we talking about Catholic or Protestant? Hold, hold, hold on a second, hold on, one at a time here. Uh, what were you saying, Sam? Uh, which seminaries yeah. were you talking about? Well, I don't for, know specific seminaries, but like I remember, I'm not sure. Like I don't know enough about individual seminaries, but I uh, I've heard stories about how they tend to be very liberal, and like uh. Like uh, you know Bulbasaur from TRS. Maybe you guys know him from the Daily Show. He uh, I listened to a podcast he appeared on he recently, and he talked about how a friend of his who was a pretty conservative Christian, he went to seminary and he came back basically like as a revolutionary Marxist, and it was just like he now thinks that like the church's duty is to be like basically made him into an SJW. <laughs> like, so it makes me wonder: is there stuff going on in different seminaries that? Well, I think this was stuff the like, for example, my school. It's to a light extent, but I can imagine. Yeah, there are there are definitely theology teachers like who, like, went after me because I, or like, they were. Because, for example, I had a substitute teacher who was who pretty much gave a huge argument in class, like why fag marriage is wrong, and then the real teacher was like. Uh, you know, the, the church doesn't condemn faggotry. It's like the, the, it condemns sodomy. You know, some, same thing. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a distinction without difference. Yeah, I should have used the same words. <clears throat> Basically the same, but Well, yeah, but I mean, you can't argue that the church would approve of like a same-sex union, would it? It, it would. I, I don't. And how it was worded is that, like they don't approve of the acts, but like 
But it's like the love that they support. It's like it, they they made it. They pretty much cocked on it. It's like <laughs> you're. I mean, I can the see only thing that like. It's ahead, like they on. worded so carefully in order to um, not offend either offend. side. It's not to offend. I don't want to be offended. Oh my god, I'm going to kill myself with Clorox. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's these people. You just have to kind of scare them. Into... It, well, I mean, it, it, it just takes to break the cuck thing. It's just to kind of go after them and not be remorseful. Well, I think, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, if you're just kind of, like, very firm about what you believe in, you don't back down, that's definitely a good thing. But, I mean, it's not always wise to be, like, just militant about certain things or... Militant, yeah, well, about you, should be, you should be kind I mean, of merciful with, a, with an open hand, but always be, you know, with no remorse Resolute. when it comes to principles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys want to wind down this conversation because I mean I'm getting kind of tired. I've been going for three hours, and I want these to. Yeah. I don't want these to go on so long. Yeah. We're down to three viewers, although we didn't we didn't get the very high. Cause I don't know if we didn't get a high number of viewers today because I think we were up to maybe six or seven at one point. But it's always time. good to have your streams coordinated. So it's like, what do you mean coordinated? That's the issue coordinated so like people know when the stream is going on yeah well i do announce it on my twitter what day i try to announce it at least two days in advance but i mean i guess this last week like I've... even because I, I find this within my own experience is that if, even if you're kind of a warned in advance it's best you'll know something better if it's around that time like oh well it's like wednesday i have to take out the trash yeah yeah yeah, I know that is just. I, I decided to do Friday today this week just because I, I felt like I wanted to give people enough notice of it, and I forgot to send out an email on Monday, so I, on Tuesday, I said let's do it on Friday last time, and it worked okay. So, yeah. whatever. I mean, I try to be flexible just to accommodate different people participating. So, yeah, All right. You guys have anything else you want to talk about or think we should get going or I think we should get going. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm kind of tired. I should probably it's a little bit late. late so. Yeah. It's late. I'm pretty right. tired. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, guys. It's good talking to you all. You're welcome. So, yeah, just thank you. Wrap up real quick. Thanks to uh thank you to Mark Citadel and William Scott who were here earlier and thanks Lightning Patriot, Sam Heidelberg and Louis, thanks for all coming. It's good to chat with all you. So uh, have a good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I guess we'll probably – this is probably going to be the last one for 2016. Probably, I'm assuming two weeks from now is going to be New Year's, so people will probably be busy with family and stuff like that. So yeah. we'll maybe maybe it'll be three weeks or so until the, the next one. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys then. And Current year. Oh. All right. Almost over. It'll be 2017. Can you believe that? It's 2017, folks. Get your. Uh, let, let's prepare for the. Let's prepare the camps. <laughs> We're going that right wing. <laughs> it's 2017. You're still in SJW. <laughs> <laughs> Go be, become a rioter on the streets. 20... The the revolution against Trump is only beginning. <laughs> like that was so last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of syllables. Drink yeah. Clorox. <laughs> if you're Greek, it has to be Windex, like um, Tula's, oh, yeah. my... Tula's father. Yeah, my big yeah. Greek wedding. I remember that yeah. joke. Yeah, I love that All movie. Right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a, it's actually a pretty good movie. Yeah, I liked it. Have you have any of you uh, guys seen the sequel yet? Uh, I haven't. No. No, I I I'm haven't wondering... heard anything good about it, so I haven't. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if it's like trouble. any good. You know, I'm like kind of have a suspicion that like they kind of 
snuck in a little bit of pause since it's yeah, like 2016. Probably. You know, <laughs> like it's not, it's probably not like a wholesome family movie like the first one was. Well, like, first one, wrong? not family movie necessarily, or I mean, I don't know, like they have. Well, it's ever it's sleeping PG. with the guy before she's married. Well, yeah. Well, I don't remember that part. Yeah. But, I mean, well, if that's the, the worst thing in a movie, um, then it's pretty good. I guess. By Hollywood standards, that's pretty... That's um, true. Tame. Yeah. But, well, yeah, but real quick, let's just sign off. Yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. We're going to Fine off. Maybe we can keep talking for a few minutes yeah. off the air, but just wanted to get the the uh, actual video part of it, the stream part, tightened up. So three hours is a good time. All right. Have a good night, listeners. See you next time.